we're talking about COVID, long COVID, and spike protein damage. So there's there's three things really. Even though COVID is 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 less of an issue now, uh, it's still worth going through the background of it a little bit to to know how the disease works and how it how it progresses in both a Western sense and a Chinese medicine sense. Uh, and then we'll go into long COVID and we'll also talk a bit about spike protein damage uh, after that. So uh, this is the sort of situation or one of the latest uh, views of the situation from the World Health Organization um, uh, in terms of the numbers of cases and the deaths uh, from COVID. Now, of course, there's lots of conjecture and lots of debate about which uh, data sets are uh, correct and whether there's over uh, over um, exaggeration of deaths in certain aspects and also there may be countries that are underreporting as well so but this is the where we are at the moment we're pretty much the tail end of uh, of the of the pandemic if you like and it's endemic in its nature now so the cases in the UK have come right down there since since uh, early last year um, probably not uh, so much because we're having less cases because we're not t testing anymore so April the 1st last year, they stopped testing uh, widely. And so, of course, the recorded number of cases uh, plummeted. So anyway, so we're not going to dwell too much on that. We all kind of know the the, the various uh, bits and pieces there. So so COVID, just let's, let's go through it. I mean, this has obviously changed because COVID is now less serious or severe than it was. But you've got four basic phases of, of the disease. Um, you've got the contact phase where there's little or no symptoms when you actually come, uh, uh, come into contact with the, the virus. Um, and susceptibility varies uh, between people. Um, some people are more susceptible than others. Generally, it's about five or seven days incubation time. And then you enter the viral phase. The viral phase is, is you have a rapid amount of viral replication going on. Uh, you have acute upper respiratory tract symptoms, fever, lethargy, sore throat, cough, runny nose. Those have changed also through time. Uh, now we're seeing more sore throats, for instance, uh, with, with COVID, and it's much milder. Um, initially, there was a dry cough and not much sore throat. So uh, things are changing as, as we go. The original COVID had a lot of body aches and nausea uh, and, and typically fatigue as well. So there's sort of cold and flu symptoms as such. And then we move on to the inflammatory phase. Now, not everyone reaches this phase. Some people do, some people don't. This is where it becomes a little bit more dangerous, if you like, because the, there's the potential for cytokine storm to develop. Um, and this typically is around day seven to eight after we've started having symptoms. And um, that can catch some people by surprise because uh, quite often symptoms are getting less at that point. Uh, and, and people decide to do more, and then all of a sudden they crash because they have this inflammatory phase kicking off. Uh, and that's when you get inflammatory molecules uh, in, infiltrating into tissues. The lungs are, are quite badly affected. You can get fibrosis of the lung, uh, and, and ultimately it can get it to a cytokine storm where there's rampant inflammation, and that becomes very, very dangerous. And that's what hospitalized people in the, uh, in the first year and moving into the second year of the pandemic. So it's a dangerous phase, needs to be managed properly, um, but it still does happen, but uh, thankfully not for most people. And then the, the, the fourth phase is more of a, a blood-based phase where you get clotting disorders from COVID. So we know that COVID, not a, it's a, a curious virus in a way, um, in that it has this, this, this clotting disorder aspect to it where we get microclots and hemolytic disorders. So there's blood flow issues, there can be embolisms, there can be microclots, poor blood flow, difficulty breathing, you can get um, heart issues, myocarditis, pericarditis, those sorts of things, very rare, but they do happen uh, even with natural COVID. Um, and uh, and if it becomes serious that, you know, you hospitalize, then that, that's obviously a very, very serious situation, which needs to be dealt with very, very carefully. So that's the kind of uh, the, the sequelae, if you like, of, of, of acute COVID as it was. So thankfully, it's not as serious anymore. And this is just a representation of those phases one leads to another and not everyone goes through the same patterns but essentially that's that's what happens uh you know in in 30 days okay so we're just not going to go through this very much because it's it's a bit too much detail at the moment um essentially how covid works is the spike protein which is the unique aspect of covid enters into ace2 receptors now ace2 receptors are these little receptor sites that present on certain cells in the body and that's where the virus attaches to and allows it to enter the cell and then propagate and and replicate as a virus now the ace2 receptor cells are most prolific in the lungs 
and uh, but they're also present throughout the body. So there are other organs with, with ACE2 receptors. So they can be affected too. But essentially, with an upper respiratory tract infection like COVID, it's the lungs that, that uh, take the, the hit to start with. Uh, it also uh, affects the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. So uh, we obviously, when we have a cold, an upper respiratory cold or a flu, um, we swallow sputum quite a lot so that those particles can get into the, the digestive system. So to start with, a lot of people had digestive problems as well with COVID. That wasn't unusual. So once the RNA is inside the cells, we get replication, and this causes inflammatory uh, cytokine uh, reaction to destroy those cells once they've uh, had the viral replication going on within them. So you get cell death as well. So you have this immune response going on uh, with all these you know, different uh, factors, chemotactic factors that come in uh, to, to uh, modulate the immune system and modulate the immune system's response to the virus. Uh, that's where you get the fever, you get the sweats, the typical sort of cold and flu symptoms of a battle going on. Your immune system is trying to react and inflammation is one of the ways it reacts. So inflammation is quite normal in that instance um, uh, with the body trying to clean up the mess this virus is producing. So we get different cells released uh, and, and, uh, and certain uh, lung tissue destroyed as part of that process. So scarring was one of the early things of uh, COVID, scarring of the... Uh, or fibrosis of the lung tissue. And then in some people, it, it, it gets onto severe symptoms. So 15 to 20% of cases, you have this sort of runaway immune response causing a cytokine storm. Uh, and, uh, and that can then obviously result in death, but also things like organ failure, sepsis. Uh, people have, were ventilated early on uh, for better or for worse. Uh, turns out probably for worse. But um, that uh, didn't happen in very many people, thankfully, who were infected, but uh, mainly elderly and uh, immune compromised people did have uh, complications like that. So what's the importance of ACE2? Well, ACE2 is important throughout this talk. So it's not just for what happened three years ago uh, and the start of the pandemic. ACE2 receptors are what make the spike protein unique in COVID and, and uh, COVID uh, is unique in the fact that the spike protein has a furan cleavage site, which they're now thinking um, was probably engineered in, in a lab. So the lab leak theory is now gaining a lot of ground because there's no way that or they certainly haven't found it in nature as of yet. So this uh, furan cleavage site makes the spike protein more able to infect human tissue uh, and specifically those that have got ACE2 receptors presenting. So uh, any any uh, any ACE2 receptor presenting cell is potentially a target for spike protein, and spike protein obviously occurs naturally as part of the virus, but also um, from the vaccines we we do create spike protein from our own cells. So we'll come on to that a bit later. So basically, the COVID spike protein acts to, uh, binds to the ACE2. So what what's important about that? Well, ACE2 is a really important component of of our modulatory system. Uh, for not only the, um, the, the renin angiotensin system, it's called the RAS system, that has a lot of key, uh, key roles in, in physiology. Most importantly, it, it, it regulates the immune response. It, it also is involved with vasoconstriction and um, inflammation uh, responses. So, so when, when that whole system is, is, is affected, you can get hypertension, for instance. You can get problems with uh, vasoconstriction, blood pressure rises. Uh, and also the ACE2 is, is important to, to modulate atherosclerotic formation, for instance. So that's plaques that form in the blood vessels. So it's a very, very important part of physiology. And, and when that's affected, um, the ACE2 cells, once they've been uh, bound with spike protein, uh, are then destroyed by the immune system. So we, we then have a, a lack of ACE2 uh, receptors in, in our lungs and, and, and even in the gut. So the gut gets affected by that destruction of ACE2 receptor cell cells as well. Uh, and it's got a very, very key component on modulating the, the microbiome of the gut as well, ACE2. So it's important in that regard. So, so really, I mean, COVID-19 uh, um, is a vascular uh, virus, uh, viral condition. Um, and it's characterized by, by inflammation and thrombotic effects, which is quite unusual because not all viruses do that. Um, most viruses, if they're ser serious, like the flu virus, for instance, um, will create a certain level of inflammation, and that's the immune response. But not many have as, as wide thrombotic effects as COVID. 
So for most people, it's just a, an uncomfortable few days. Um, but as I said before, there's this day seven or eight where, where it can potentially turn into a, a, a cytokine, a runaway cytokine storm. Um, and that's a, more of an, a hypersensitivity reaction. And that's, um, that's been linked to uh, the use of antihistamines, for instance, to try and damper that down. If people do have that reaction, that's now being talked about, but it catches most people unaware. So most people think they're getting better at day seven or eight, and all of a sudden they'll be flattened. Uh, as, as most people have, who are watching probably have had COVID uh, once or more than once. So you probably know what I'm talking about if you had it seriously, or even if you just had it mildly. So things have changed. I mean, uh, since we had the initial wave, um, we've got to ask ourselves who's now at risk or who was at risk in the first place. Um, the, the statistics uh, of who was actually at risk have changed quite markedly over the last year, um, or certainly the reporting of who was at risk. We were, we were led to believe that everyone was at risk and we had to do what we could to prevent um, you know, infection. But actually, most of the deaths, the mean age of death is 83 in COVID. So uh, it's mostly the elderly that were affected by COVID. Um, 70, uh, those over 70 have a thousand times the risk uh, that children do, for instance, of severe um, effects from COVID. So the, 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 the mortality from Delta, this is an old slide, this was last year, that when Delta was uh, uh, just disappearing. Um, that was the sort of last nasty strain, if you like. Uh, was still way under 1%. So the mortality rate is actually very, very low for COVID. So one could argue that there was an overreaction possibly on, on, on the response to COVID, but that's a, a little bit of a different issue. So the people who are, are actually um, uh, more susceptible to the, the, the severe effects of COVID were the elderly and those with comorbidities, specifically diabetes, obesity, heart disease, kidney disease. Um, and uh, there was a, a vast majority of people who ended up in hospital would have those comorbidities, either one to four comorbidities. Um, so if you didn't have those, you'd be very unlucky to, to, to be severely affected by, by COVID. Uh, and early treatment and prevention, prevention could have slashed hospital uh, admissions and deaths quite substantially, but we were really quite slow on the uptake of, of how to deal with COVID properly. So we never were really uh, exposed to those health messages about how to look after ourselves uh, we were just told to, um, you know, lock ourselves away, mask up, and um, uh, and then obviously be part of the vaccination campaign. So there's a lot of debate there. And there's just a graphical representation of the deaths attributed to COVID per million people. Uh, this uh, was actually from 2020. So this is the kind of original first year of the pandemic. And you can see that below the age of 50, there's, there's an almost negligible risk from COVID. And yet we made it, um, made it a, a population-wide problem. So this is a, there's a lot of information on here, but it is actually a very important slide for what we're going to be talking about later on, uh, especially when it comes to um, vaccination uh, effects and those sorts of things. This was actually a report that was from, uh, it was actually generated in 2020 or 21, I think, but then it got published in 22. And it was talking about the convalescence after COVID. Um, and some of these things are quite surprising. Um, because, uh, you know, we were told or some people uh, said that actually COVID is very mild. There's no um, lasting consequence of having COVID. Uh, and as we know with long COVID, that's not true. Long COVID is, is certainly a thing, a post-viral syndrome, if you like. But these are some of the really interesting things. 50% of asymptom asymptomatic patients have atypical chest CT findings, basically these sort of ground glass opacities of fibrosis in the lung. So um, that, that was interesting as well. You don't have to have severe COVID for that to happen. So there are instances where we see patients that come in, they had a very mild case of COVID or possibly even didn't know they had COVID and just tested positive. Uh, and they had this ongoing cough or chest problem or, or difficulty breathing. Um, that, that's, that's fairly common. Uh, I didn't realize it was that common, 50% of asymptomatic pa patients. Uh, also, you get this unresolved post-viral fibrosis that can that can lead to you know pulmonary function being being restricted over time. Usually, it gets better, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, this is also an interesting thing about uh, patients over the age of sixty-five who were hospitalised um, were a much greater risk of cardiovascular disease and events for a year uh, following on from viral infection. 
And that is, not, that is actually also true about other viruses, um, colds and flus. It does actually increase your risk of cardiovascular problems um, for up to a year after. They looked at it, they're saying that it could remain elevated for up to 10 years afterwards for elderly patients. Liver impairment was also common. Uh, where you know 18 to 20 percent of um, patients with non-severe COVID in China had raised liver function tests. Um, you know that so that it does affect the liver. The liver clears up all the detritus after a viral infection. So you know you can have this inflammation reaching the liver. Um, the, the the activation or the coagulation cascade, as we call it, um, is is key to as I said, COVID is part of its characteristic. So um, people were actually suffering from thrombocytopenia, uh, elevated D-dimer, which is a measure of uh, how well our, our blood clots. Um, and uh, you know, also there's the things that we now think are uh, either part of long COVID, the clotting factors or post-vaccine actually is, you know, was affecting a lot of people after the initial waves of COVID before we even started vaccinating people. Okay. And also uh, immune dysregulation is part of the uh, post uh, viral situation with a lot of people. And that plays into long COVID where you get this, this impaired adaptive immunity where your immune system just doesn't function properly for a while after having a virus. Uh, and that's probably explains a lot of long COVID. We'll come on to that a bit later. So um, other, other lingering fatigue from inflammation, very typical as well. After most viruses, most people who get a, a nasty cold or a flu can, can feel under the weather for, for several weeks, if not a month or two afterwards. Um, so that's not unusual. And they, there can be also links to depression and low mood, um, especially if our gut has been affected because a lot of our um, serotonin and, and neural transmitters are actually from uh, the gut. So let's go on to a bit of Chinese medicine. Now, again, there's, there's different people watching this. So uh, hopefully this is a very, very brief summation of how Chinese medicine views COVID-19. Uh, I've even spelt medicine without the end. So there you go. Um, it's a very complex medical system despite its age. So it's been around for 2000 years uh, and it's grown with clinical experience over that time. So there's a huge amount of clinical experience that's both been uh, documented uh, and passed on over 2000 years. Some of the earliest texts were written in 3000 uh, AD, uh, 300 AD, for instance. So um, the early texts in Chinese medicine were actually all about the treatment of epidemics because epidemics was the major killer uh, in that era. So, you know, epidemics would sweep through China and, and wipe out, you know, whole villages. And so the early doctors who studied herbal medicine um, in Chinese medicine um, were keen to understand the, the patho mechanism of, of viral diseases and find solutions on how to treat them. So there's this vast body of evidence that has been treating epidemics for, for 2000 years. Um, and it's, it's a system of medicine that's based on metaphors. So this is, this is quite unique in that it sounds a, a little bit non-scientific to some people who haven't been introduced to Chinese medicine before, because we, we talk about things like wind, cold, heat, toxic heat, fire, damp, phlegm, dryness. Those are the sort of pathogenic factors that can affect the body. And they're just metaphors for viruses, bacteria, environmental factors, and, and things like that, that we, we now understand a bit more in a scientific sense. So there's a distinction whether they're actually affecting the external part of the body or the internal part of the body. So this is how we, we break things down in Chinese medicine. We, we, we sit with our patients and we ask a lot of questions to try and differentiate a pattern because two people might come in with the same condition, but they might have completely different patterns. One might be hot, one might be cold. So we look at whether it's internal, external, uh, whether there's pathogenic factors affecting the body, but also whether there's a deficiency or an excess of some of the, the crucial things uh, that make up the physiology of the body, like yin and yang. Yin and yang is, is a poorly understood um, phrase for most people, but it's actually just a, um, a relative differentiation of everything. So you're, it's either high or low, uh, hot or cold. It's, you can't have one without the other because one defines the other. So it's a way of trying to assess what is out of balance in the body. Um, and then we have the body fluids and the chi in the blood. Uh, again, there's, there's a lot of mis, uh, misunderstanding about what is meant by those, but essentially blood is blood uh, for, for, for all intents and purposes. Um, and chi is more like function, function of organs, function of tissues, function, function of the body as a whole. So 
you know, we can't work with without both of those things. The blood carries oxygen to tissues. That's what makes it work. So chi and blood uh, is a way of talking about that balance. And then we have stagnations of food, blood, chi or phlegm, and they can cause blockage uh, in the body and, and prevent it from working properly, we'll prevent the chi from activating certain tissues. Um, so we also look at that. And then on top of that, we also look at emotional uh, factors as well. So that's very, very important with Chinese medicine. We know that the body is not uh, detached from the brain or from the emotions, uh, and the emotions can affect the body and vice versa. So that is, in a nutshell, very, very brief summation of how Chinese medicine uh, looks at most disease, in fact, all disease. But how does it actually view COVID uh, and, and viruses? So on the, um, as you're looking at on the left there, you have uh, essentially the scientific understanding of how a viral pathogen enters into the body, generates an immune response initially, mucosal immunity is, is developed, and you have these cellular responses with macrophages and natural uh, killer cells, et cetera. And then you get the, the more acquired immune system kicking in and, and delivering T cells and B cell responses. And that's our immune system response. And that is then uh, accompanied by inflammation, redness, swelling, pain, heat. Those are all part of that response. So, you know, Western sciences, sciences understand this very well. Uh, and then, you know, if it gets very, very uh, serious, you can get the, the the more serious condition with chronic inflammation setting in with cell uh, apoptosis or cell death, tissue destruction and loss of function. So it's very, very difficult to make direct comparisons, but this is uh, we'll, we'll try. Um, so the, the on the right hand side is, is a kind of uh, an understanding in Chinese medicine of how the metaphorical pathogens enter the body. Uh, into different levels. So there are similarities there, and they're, they're kind of next to uh, the appropriate uh, section on the other side there. So Chinese medicine talks about this pathogen entering the body. Catching a cold is literally a thing. So in Chinese medicine, one does literally catch a cold if, if one gets chilled around the neck. Uh, and there's this cold enters into the body. Uh, there's no such thing as viruses in Chinese medicine um, uh, when, when they were writing these texts. But our defensive chi is essentially our mucosal layer in the gut, in the lung, and also on the surface of the body. And that's what generates the first response. It's our defense uh, in the mucous layers of the throat, et cetera. So once, if, the, if our defensive uh, chi level doesn't deal with the pathogen, it can then go into a deeper level where an, an actual bodily immune response is generated. Uh, and that's called a chi level response. It's a little bit deeper. And that's where you have this ac active battle between the immune system and the pathogen. Uh, and essentially, that's where it should end. Um, and that's why the green, the green arrows signify that that, that should you know, kick the virus back outwards uh, and the, the body should, should recover. However, sometimes it can go to a deeper level. Uh, and that's where the problems arise for chronic disease, because the yin level and the blood level are just deeper aspects of the body. Uh, and, and, and it's very, very difficult to treat by venting outwards, for instance, um, one has to deal with the pathogen in situ. So there's different techniques and different herbs used for all those different levels. So again, it's just a distinction and an explanation of, of what's going on in the body. So COVID-19, uh, we've Chinese medicine practitioners have been treating this from the start. Um, we weren't really allowed to say we treated COVID-19, but we had patients that we were treating uh, throughout, um, either remotely or um, uh, with, with herbs, uh, and when we could, with acupuncture and cupping and moxa. So Chinese medicine comprises of these different uh, modalities, Chinese herbal medicine, acupuncture, moxa and cupping, Tuina, Qigong, and dietary therapy and lifestyle. So all those things are uh, part of Chinese medicine and many practitioners do them all. Some uh, are just acupuncturists or just herbalists, um, but that's the sort of full complement of modalities within Chinese medicine. All very, very important in their own right. So the strength of Chinese medicine is combining herbs into formulas that address all the aspects of pathology and physiology and changing the approach as the disease progresses. That's very, very important because it's not a one size fits all medicine. And that's what makes it so challenging to, to practice Chinese medicine, but also so rewarding when you can get a, a really strong response, depending on where someone is in their disease process. So formulas are chosen on based, of, uh, chosen based on presentation of symptoms, 
and individual responses to the pathogen. Like I say, everyone responds differently. There are many, many formulas that can be used based on 2,000 years of experience in the treatment of viral epidemics. So we, we, can't, we simply can't cover all of them tonight. There are literally large volumes uh, dedicated to the study of, of viral epidemics in Chinese medicine. So there's, there's hundreds of formulas that are applied based on the particular presentation that a patient may present with. So some of the useful properties of herbal medicine for COVID specifically. Again, we're sort of going to be going, we're going to be tiptoeing from Western medicine to Chinese medicine and trying to draw parallels between the two. Many of the herbs we use uh, um, in, in epidemic uh, treatment of epidemics have the following properties. Many of them are antiviral, they're antipyretic, they lower temperature, they're antitussive, they stop cough, they're anti, anti asthmatic, they treat the lungs, uh, expectorant, we all know what that is. Um, and many of them are also antibiotics and anti-inflammatories. So some of them are steroidal, uh, many of them are immunomodulatory, uh, and then you also have those that are antihistaminic, antithrombotic, the ones that move blood, uh, thin the blood, if you like, and hemostatic, and anti-apoptic, -apop which is uh, protecting cells from cell death or encouraging uh, tissue repair. So some of these are applied in the acute viral phases, some are applied in the acute inflammatory phase, and others then are applied in the thrombotic phase, if you like, and also possibly during the whole process to give a, a, a thrombotic effect. So they're very, very useful. And this is a sort of breakdown of, of, of how we might pick some of those things in different phases, because we don't want to apply, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't want to apply the same herbs throughout the whole process because this body is changing uh, and the response uh, is changing as we go. So we just change the herbs as, as the disease progresses. <clears throat> so we're just gonna use this formula that was developed in China as a bit of a, an example of, of how formulas are put together in Chinese medicine. And it's, it's fairly instructional when it comes to the treatment of COVID. This Ching Fei Pei Du Tang, a clear the lungs and eliminate to uh, toxins decoction was developed in China uh, with, there was a big response from the Chinese medicine industry uh, and profession in China that they got together and said, okay, well, what's the nature of this disease and how can we best treat it with Chinese medicine? There were very few other treatments available at the time, so they, they did what they could. Poorly understood to start with, but it, we had a framework in Chinese medicine to actually understand the signs and symptoms. So this Ching Fei Pei Du Tang was, was developed uh, in China and used quite heavily. And there was a study that actually found that it was associated with a relative reduction of 50% hospital mortality. Now that is as good, if not better than any of the drugs they've used since, uh, or certainly in the first two years of the pandemic. So we'll leave it to you to, to decide why that wasn't used more widely. Of course, Chinese medicine isn't uh, as easily studied and there's not much money in it. This is a little bit of a breakdown of how this formula was developed, if you like. It's a formula that's based on five or four, four traditional formulas, plus some additional uh, herbs. And each formula does something slightly different in, in the mix. So this is just an idea of, it, it may seem quite confusing if you're not used to Chinese medicine uh, speak, if you like. But you have this cold dampness toxin invading uh, the, the, the nose, the mouth and the skin. And then it, it enters the body and you get this sort of transformation of, of cold into heat inside. That's the inflammation, mainly affecting the lung. Uh, you get phlegm stagnating in the lung. And that's, that's with most upper respiratory diseases. We get this phlegm developing as a, as a mucosal immune response. And that can cause obstruction. So some parts of the formula are treating the phlegm. Some parts are, are treating the, the lung to help it diffuse and, and stop cough. And then you're having other ones that actually uh, got a slight steroidal action, the Chinese yam uh, there, and they also got ones that are, are designed to actually um, deal with the cold nature of the, the damp cold that's invaded. So it's a bit of a curious, uh, a curious description that if you're not used to Chinese medicine, but cold dampness, it originally was a cold damp pathogen. So uh, we have to be mindful of that when we choose herbs that treat uh, a cold dampness. So we don't want to be using lots of cold herbs, for instance, it would make it worse. And some of the other ones are, are, are to do with uh, bolstering the, the immune response, like uh, cinnamon twig and licorice down the bottom there, glycerea. 
So this is a, we're not going to dwell on the actual herbs because this is a very big formula. But these are the different formulas. So we have different herbs from different formulas. They're not complete formulas by any means. It's, it's most of these formula, but not the entire formula. It's combined together. Some would have been repetitions if we'd have had the, the formula in, in, in its entirety. But you had uh, you know, these traditional herbs uh, used in these formulas to actually treat the lung, treat cough, uh, treat inflammation and an immune system response to a virus. But also there's a formula in their wooling sound which treat damp. And uh, that's not uh, evident or needed in a lot of uh, epidemics because there's not necessarily a lot of damp in, in your, your average cold or flu. But uh, this was a particularly heavy damp pathogen. So these, uh, these, these herbs in Wuling San tend to be diuretics and they promote the, uh, the excretion of damp through the urine. And then there's some additions that were put in there, um, uh, things like patchouli at the bottom, which is uh, very, uh, very good for COVID. It's antiviral. Uh, treats the digestive aspect of COVID. And then you've got the Chen Pi and Jersha, which are both orange peels. Uh, one's immature and one's uh, aged. And they help to just keep things moving. They actually are great for the motility of the gut, for instance. So it just keeps things moving. So anyway, it's a very complex formula, but uh, hard to uh, go through quickly. But uh, this is uh, a, a, a breakdown of all the... Um, pharmacological effects of those formulas. So you have, as I said, antitussive, anti-asthmatic, anti-inflammatory, antipyretic from one formula, diuretic and protection of the kidneys from Wuling San. Zhao Chai Hu Tang is a very famous formula for the treatment of any pathogen that, that comes in to that sort of mid, half external, half internal layer where there's this battle going on with, uh, with sort of alternating hot and cold, the classic sort of viral response. Fantastic for that. Uh, and again, there's some there's doubling up of some of these formulas in their actions. So very successful development of a formula there. This is um, just a, a little bit of a, a breakdown of, of um, how epidemics are categorized in Chinese medicine. So th th these are some of the, the metaphors, if you like, that are used for Shanghai cold damage, which was the early the, the earliest epidemic text. The Shanghan Lun, uh, which mainly dealt with warming up the system to vent out pathogens when they entered the body, uh, and then a, a couple of hundred years later, when when Bing was was written, was more warm pestilence. That's far more virulent uh, epidemics that would have lots more heat, lots more inflammation, lots more sore throat, and they were very very rapid in their in their progression and also spread. So there's different types of epidemics that were that were focused on with with these type of patterns. And sometimes you get a combination of, of the two or a change from one to the other. These are just some formulas that are applied to wind heat conditions. So this warm epidemics. And this is actually what's happened with COVID. So for the Omicron, for instance, is a far more uh, warm pathogen. Uh, it, it's, it's characterized by a sore throat, for instance. Uh, it's, it's quite rapid. It's incredibly... Or, it's even more infectious than the original strains. Um, so it has more characteristics of a warm pathogen. So we don't need to go into the herbs of these, but this is kind of the way that those formulas work. They release the exterior with cold herbs. Uh, they clear heat and they eliminate cough or they purge fire toxins or some stronger ones will, will be far more antibacterial, for instance, if the, if the lung has got a bacterial infection following on from the initial virus. So this is one other, there's lots of herbal formulas. There's probably 20, 30, 40 herbal formulas that were developed and suggested for the use of, co of COVID. This was just one of the other ones, which is just useful to touch on, uh, which had a, a, a lot of research behind it and was suggested uh, by the Chinese government and the, uh, the Chinese medicine profession. Um, Liang Hua Ching Wen um, significantly inhibited SARS-CoV-2 replication affects virus morphology and exerts anti-inflammatory activity in vivo. These findings indicate that uh, this formula protects against the virus attack, making its use a novel strategy for controlling COVID-19 disease. So again, a lot of research put into that and they're showing the actual physiological way that that works uh, and, and very strong antiviral effect. 
and that's the components. Marshing Shurgan Tang was in the original Qingfei uh, Peidu Tang formula, and then Yin Chao San was one of the examples of this new formula that's for a more warm disease. So it's again a changed changed type of approach. And interestingly, the additions that were added to that uh, uh, more recent formula were have all been shown to block spike protein and uh, quite quite. Uh, well, they affect the replication of the virus in the cells. They block replication, they block spike protein uh, attaching to ACE2 receptors. So all those herbs there that were added are very good for that purpose. <clears throat> so just a little bit of a breakdown, uh, uh, finally, uh, in this section of um, some of the herbs that we use with antiviral effect. Things like honeysuckle, Jinyanhua is probably the most famous of them all. Um, and uh, as a result, the price of honeysuckle has gone through the roof over the last uh, two or three years. Um, for Scythia, Lian Chao, those two are used together quite often in these warm diseases. So Yin Chao San is, is the former that's typically uh, uh, made those two famous. Um, it's used all the time for, for acute cold with sore throat. Ban Langan, very good for sore throats as well. Um, and the other, the other herbs there are all used uh, for antiviral effects. Some are warm, some are cold. Huang Lian is berberine and Huang Qin is scutellaria. Those two have got a very, very strong antiviral and antimicrobial effect. So if there is potential for bacterial infection, uh, they, they can be used for that as well, but they do have a strong antiviral effect. So there's just some herbs that we use for antiviral effect. Herbs with anti-inflammatory effect. There are loads of them. There are so many herbs in our pharmacopoeia that have actually got anti-inflammatory effects, and they, they tend to do that by modulating the immune factors that are pro-inflammatory. So they, they tend to sort of reduce the inflammatory interleukins, for instance, interleukin 1, 7, 8, yeah, this um, interferon gamma and tissue necrosing factor alpha, those things are all pro-inflammatory. So these herbs have been, uh, been shown to reduce those. So they're very good at bringing down inflammation, bringing down heat. So most of them are heat clearing in Chinese medicine. That's their distinction, their, 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 their categorization. So Da Huang is rhubarb root. Um, Huang Qi, scutellaria, we've already seen in the, in the previous slide. So we've already seen uh, honeysuckle and forsythia. Those are very, very cold, uh, also have an anti-inflammatory effect as well as an antiviral effect. You've also got patchouli there, horshuang. Uh, Guang Ho Shang, which is patchouli. Again, that's in both categories. Dan Shen Salvia is a very useful herb. It's anti-inflammatory, but it also moves the blood. It thins the blood slightly. So it's a hemostatic herb, which is fantastic for COVID. Shur Gao is gypsum. It brings uh, temperature down very quickly. Pyretic, it's an antipyretic. Uh, and Da Ching Ye is, a, is another form of the uh, Isatidis uh, herb that uh, was in the previous slide. So there are loads more. This is just a small selection uh, of herbs with anti-inflammatory effect. They're typically the ones that are used in the formulas that we use for COVID. So then herbs that can help us with uh, platelet formation and uh, have an anticoagulant effect. Again, there's lots and lots of, to choose from, and these are the main ones. Dan Shen, as I've said, salvia, which is uh, Chinese sage, uh, is probably the king uh, in this instance because it is very, very useful in, in viral uh, pathologies. Mudan P is uh, peony, uh, tree peony. Churshao is also peony, uh, which is uh, um, uh, a white peony. Tauren is uh, a, 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 a kernel, it's a, a seed. Uh, Honghua is this canthamy floss, that's saffron. Uh, so some of these are familiar to most people, but they, they wouldn't necessarily know the Chinese names. And there are other herbs in there. Uh, we've got the rhubarb root again, which uh, moves blood. Uh, and Chinese lovage, Chuan Shong, is also a very, very good blood mover, especially for headaches and things like that. Moves blood uh, and also is very good for tissue repair. So just some herbs there which have got a anti-thrombotic effect. And then finally, herbs that restore function of organs, which are very, very important in the, uh, in the recovery phase from, from COVID-19. So many of these, uh, Huang Qi is probably the most famous, uh, Astragalus, uh, that's an, a strong tonic. It has a, a, a tonifying effect on both the digestion, but also our qi, so it, it fires up the function of, of tissues in the body. Uh, Gochitsa is goji berries. That's uh, very good for the kidneys um, and, and also recovery of tissues. 
Um, other things in there, again, Huang Qin, Huang Lian, those ones have been in previous categories as well, and so have Chuan Shong and San Qi. So you see repeats of herbs uh, throughout this. Rhodiola is, is a very, very good herb for long COVID, as it turns out, and also possibly for vaccine damage. So it's uh, that's being uh, investigated quite a bit for its immune modulating and uh, anti-inflammatory as well, very good uh, uh, antioxidant. So this is a key slide for many reasons. This is a list of some of the herbs that have been studied uh, for their ability to block spike protein uh, and its entry into ACE2 receptors. So effectively uh, being able to stop the cells becoming infected or damaged uh, from spike protein in the first place. And also uh, some of the herbs that have a, an ability to block what's called the, the chymotrypsin-like protease within the cell, which is key for viral replication. So in, 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 in having a blocking effect on this 3CL Pro, um, viral replication is potentially hampered. So Many of these herbs are in the uh, acute formulas that we use for uh, for COVID, um, but also in other formulas that are used in just general viral conditions uh, because they have such a strong antiviral effect in themselves. It's a long list, but many of the ones we've already looked at are in there. Uh, many of them are highlighted, uh, the ones that we've been using in COVID. So this is just a rundown of some of the studies that have been performed for some of the compounds which seem to be useful in this regard. Um, this first one from Prunella vulgaris, which is the Jacuzzau herb we use in Chinese medicine. Also, um, the compound suramin uh, is present in pine needle tea, which has gained some notoriety over the last couple of years for its ability to block spike protein. Um, so some people have been drinking pine needle tea. But Jacuzzau, a very useful herb. Coming on to Amodin, a key compound in uh, Da Huang, which is rhubarb root. Ye Jiao Teng, Hu Jiang, and He Shao Wu, which are all in the polygonum family. And Hu Jiang is, is a very, very useful herb, as we've already seen, because it has multiple um, properties that help against COVID. So that's a mode in that also helps to block the spike proteins entry into ACE2 receptors. And then there's also studies uh, that look at uh, two compounds, uh, purarin and quercetin. Now, quercetin, uh, again, has been shown uh, to 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 be very very useful in COVID, also in the recovery stage of COVID, um, where it's a strong antiviral effect, a strong strong uh, blocking effect of of uh, spike protein uh, binding with ACE2 receptors, but also very uh, anti-inflammatory uh, in itself. Uh, and uh, so so this neutralizing effect that that these herbs have on the virus is one part, but also this blocking effect of viral entry into cells is a key component. Now. Chai Hu, which is one of the herbs we use in, in a formula like Zhao Chai Hu Tang, is, is excellent for this because it has three of these key components within it, along with many more, but they're the ones that have been studied. So it's got uh, purarin and quercetin in Chai Hu already, um, and on some of these other herbs, Gurgen, um, uh, uh, Zhuang Saogen, uh, Sibaye, uh, Shanjia, and Sangbai Pi are also rich in quercetin. There are many, many herbs which are rich in quercetin. Some of the food types uh, that, that, that we can also use for quercetin happen to be onions. Onions uh, are, are a rich source of quercetin or any foods from the onion family. Um, and that's probably why in, uh, in antiquity, one of the traditional methods of treating a cold or a flu is to have spring onion and ginger together as a hot drink. Uh, and not only does that bring on a sweat and force the uh, the, the, the the, the pathogen outwards, if you like, in the Chinese medicine sense, but it was probably because it's also very, very rich in quercetin, and quercetin has that ability to block the virus from the start. So if you get onto a, a, a viral uh, illness very, very soon in its progression, um, you're able to actually stop it um, or, or, or limit its effect anyway. So that uh, traditional uh, use of spring onions and ginger is now being shown uh, to, to probably be down to the fact that it's rich in quercetin. So coming on to this, this is just a, a breakdown again. It's very, there's a lot of detail in here. We don't really need to go into this, but it just goes to show some of the studies that have been done into some of the compounds from herbal medicine. And again, many of these are, are highlighted for their three uh, chymotryptin-like protease blocking effect. So we can see that there's lots of, her lots of herbs, lots of compounds that have useful functions uh, in the treatment of COVID. 
Right. I shall take a swig of water. Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, this is an important category, and this is a uh, one that uh, everyone wants to see. Herbs are actually uh, uh, preventing spike protein uh, entering ACE2 receptors. So these are the king herbs for um, blocking viral entry of COVID-19, but also blocking spike protein uh, from other sources. Um, typically, the spike protein that we produce in our own cells if we've had one of the mRNA vaccines. So spike protein is, is known to be toxic, and that's where the problem arises. When that attaches to ACE2 receptors, it sets up a, a cascade, an inflammatory response. So these herbs are potentially useful in that aspect. They have different mechanisms of doing that. Um, some of them actually act as blocking. Some of them block the receptors. Some of them block the spike protein. Some of them inhibit this, this chymotrypsin-like protease, which is part of the replication of virus inside the cells. Um, and some of them actually block the RNA production as well within the cells. So there's a sort of whole raft of, of, of inhibitory functions that these, uh, these herbs can um, exhibit. So we're not going to go through them all, but some of those you've already seen. But there is a nice little list, and it's not exhaustive either. There are more herbs that do that as well. This is just a bit of a screenshot of all the herbs in our uh, main pharmacology books in Chinese medicine, you can see the number there that are antiplatelet, antipyretic, anti-seizure, antibacterial, antiviral. Like I say, we've only presented some of them. So there's a, a lot of herbs that have got those functions. And this uh, just is a final representation of, of where the blocking occurs. As I said, there are some that block the entrance into ACE2, um, as you see on the top there. There are some that prevent uh, this replication inside the cell. You can see the CMS, the Chinese medicine, uh, um, it, that, that's where it's, it's exerting its effect, the CMS little portion of that. Um, and also it's very, very, they, they, they're very, very important in, in stopping the progression of this cytokine, infl cytokine inflammation, which causes all the tissue damage, right? So we may not be able to stop all the virus replicating. We might be able to inhibit some of it. But we also need to stop the, the sequelae of, of that inflammation damaging tissues. So Chinese herbs can block that, uh, that progression onto rampant inflammation and specifically preventing cytokine storm, which is essentially what lands people in hospital. I agree. And I think it's really interesting now because when we first started Jade Screen and we were looking at these formulas, we understood what they did in Chinese medicine. But now you've presented this information on the spike protein and the NRA and, you know, all of these things going on that these herbs still stand up to that. Like, oh, this is why we were using these. And, you know, we know why we use things, but to, to be able to support that now to say to people who Chinese medicine isn't their first mode of, of healing or treatment, we can say, we, we understand why this is working. I, I'm just curious if you have especially you, Martin, because, you know, you, you understand this Western side of it in a different way. Have you changed the way you've worked with formulas at all based on what you now know to be scientific backing of how we use those herbs? Or do you just like, yeah, of course. And you just have, are doing what you're doing. No, no, I mean, I have, um, I suppose I've always um, had that as part of my practice that you, you take the traditional, uh, the traditional, formula uh, based on presentation and then you think okay well that's the traditional formula is there any other information that i know that may benefit that patient um, based on a modern understanding of the pharmacology of some herbs so we might throw in a herb that traditionally might not be used for a particular purpose but then you go okay well actually that's got a very good um i don't know anti-cholesterol uh, function for instance or something like that that is more of a modern pharmacological take on a herb based on recent research and so, yeah, I throw, I do use herbs that that, that have got a more of a Western um, pharmacological action rather than specifically be purist about traditional formulas. And I know there are herbalists that are very purist, and that 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 also is great because that's a um, um, a deeper understanding sometimes into the traditions. But um, yeah, I kind of mix it up a little bit, and uh, I think COVID has 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 enabled us to do that, or meant has actually required us to do that because um 
the traditional formulas work, as Malika said, to progress people onto the next stage or to change the condition. And then we, 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 may, we might change that. But if we know that certain herbs block spike protein, for instance, um, I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would put in herbs, you know, two or three into a formula specifically for that purpose that I would never have thought about using for a, a, a virus in, in the past. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Hujang is a classic example that, 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 that we all um, got alerted to in, in the Jade Screen uh, process, uh, yeah. in the Jade Screen project. And of course, it's a wonderful herb because it's such a powerful spike protein blocker mm -hmm. and um, an anti-inflammatory as well. So there are these herbs that we wouldn't maybe otherwise use traditionally. Yeah. Yeah. Point. And and also the you know the Qingfei Pei Du Tang and these examples they are they are kind of catch all formulas and I've said everyone treats mm -hmm. the individual with patterns uh, and whatever pattern they see they treat. So these th these big formulas that are put together as a as a one stop shop it is a little bit of a a catch all formula um, which can work um, and certainly if that's what you've got on the shelf if you've got something on the shelf that may well be antiviral and 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 help. The immune system and and um, limit inflammation. It's better than nothing, right? Yeah, it's gonna. Absolutely. It's certainly gonna help. The, the problem with the start of the pandemic is that no one had any way of knowing what to do. They were just told to go home and wait. Yeah. Uh, and and certainly using over the counter cold and flu remedies is sometimes counterproductive in itself. So, you know, yeah. you know, we weren't told about things that may help us, uh, and we certainly weren't allowed in the early days to even say that we treated COVID. It seems to assume there's be the embargo on knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Martin, there's a question in the um, chat box. Can you see it? It's from Helen. Uh, hang on. Let me just uh, open that up. <clears throat> I can't see anything in mine. Okay, shall I read it? The question for Martin. Oh, sorry, Helen, you sent it to me as a direct message instead of to the group. Sorry. Um, how... Ha how have you seen patients respond to the idea there are several formulae that may be necessary across the lifespan of the infection? And do you think that this has in any way enabled people to see the sophistication of our thinking and strategy as Chinese medicine? Thank you. Helen. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, it's a good question, because uh, uh, initially we weren't really treating a lot of acute, you know, we weren't seeing acute COVID that often, were we? Because people were either isolating or they were... Well, they were isolating and they had we had to so uh we weren't able to actually treat directly in those first early stages unless we'd say it was given someone a, a an off-the-shelf formula that says this could be useful in the early stages so it was a little bit tricky following symptoms i mean i i did that myself when i had covid early on and i was able to track symptoms really really daily or even sometimes even even by the hour or two um, and change the formula accordingly but of course, not everyone has the luxury of that. And um, so sometimes off the shelf formulas uh, are kind of, they have to make do um, with standardized formulas. But um, yeah, well, even now we haven't raised, really, I don't really see that many people with acute uh, viral infections because essentially for most people, they get better in a couple of days. So it's usually the sequelae that we see in clinic. They come a week later and they got a cough that won't go or two weeks later and they feel fatigued. So um, the, the treatment of acute viral uh, um, issues is, is not really the mainstay of most people's practice, I don't think, even in the last three years. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I did have, um, there were a few clients who I um, were treating with acute COVID and the minimum formula I can order is five days. And so I was sending them one and two days later, right, get you another one. And so they did end up with a lot of, herbs extra herbs that were so bespoke for them but I was like I'm sorry but at least you're better so um <laughs> true that was the challenge wasn't it you'd be treating yeah. someone with like when we were treating these frontline workers you'd talk to them every three days and they'd go from digestive things to cough and you were just constantly tweaking these formulas and just I mean I think it was it it was a challenge but it was just like oh we're really seeing what this thing is doing and mm. and what our medicine can do you yeah. know, so like you say, you learn a lot about just three or four herbs that you're using that you rely on and like, what are you doing in here, <laughs> you know, in a very different way. Yeah. And, and, and also you get to appreciate, I think that pa patients also appreciate that a symptom might come up. And if you take the right formula, that symptom goes, 
it goes yeah. and it might be replaced by something else it might be the next phase of the disease you might you might move on a little bit um but that's all part of the resolution you know you get these these if you get stuck in the same phase that's a bad a bad situation to be in because then you're not getting resolution your your system's not responding quickly to it you want you res, you want a quick response to get through it right right yeah. Uh, so I, th I think uh, from what Helen was asking, you know, patients do see that when sometimes they say, right, it's the sore throat and you give them the herb and the, the sore throat goes and then it'll, there'll be the, the the clogged up nose and the sinuses will clog up. And then you go, right, I'll give you a formula to clear the sinuses now. And then that clears up and they might have a dry cough because it's got it's worked too well, for instance. Um, so there's, it, it, it's, an, it's an interesting process. And sometimes there's a bit of chasing the tail with uh, with viral disease, diseases. Uh, I'd like to give credit to uh, Dr. John Chen. Uh, he did a lot of work early on um, uh, from eLotus. He's the author, one of the joint authors of two of the main pharmacological uh, herbology books that we use. And so he's got a lot of information online uh, in, in the States um, about the treatment of COVID and the use of Chinese herbal medicine. So there's a lot of free stuff there that you can go and check out in more detail. Uh, and also just a, a, a snapshot of the one of the journals that we use in Chinese medicine, but uh, also lots of articles by eminent practitioners throughout the world about how to treat um, epidemics and in particular COVID-19. <clears throat> so Omicron, what, uh, where are we now? So Omicron really was a game changer. So it, Omicron sort of came about um, December of 21 uh, and, and around about Christmas time and really become the dominant strain very, very quickly, which was um, very, very thankful. It was uh, it was so dominant that um, basically all the other strains um, disappeared. So uh, there's a graph there at the bottom. You see the, the various dominance of strains as we as we went through the last three years. And Omicron is, uh, has been a, a bit of a godsend, really, because it is so much less dangerous and so much less pathogenic than the previous strains that really people are not suffering very much from it at all, unless there's another reason why they would. Um, so much less, I mean, when they talk about the, the success of um, uh, public health policy, one has to bear in mind that Omicron was actually 90% less likely uh, than Delta to uh, to result in hospitalization and death. So uh, not so much a, a result of uh, wonderful vaccination campaigns, et cetera. So uh, that was a, a, a thankful, actually. So it's become very endemic over the last year, and pretty much everyone will have come across Omicron, um, regardless of, of vaccinations or not. So 70% more infectious and transmissible. Uh, they keep on getting more infectious as they go along. And we're told that it's even more infectious than even the last infectious one. So much faster viral replication, the um, usually about three or four days now that it actually uh, replicates to symptoms um, from exposure, sometimes even less, less likely to affect the lungs. So that's really good uh, for um, fibrosis of the lungs and long, uh, long COVID, lung tissue damage, etc. Omicron is far less likely to have lung symptoms. Uh, and hardly any cytokine storm. Uh, very few patients get to that stage now. And most people don't even need treatment. So that's 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 a good thing. Here's my little homage to uh, Spinal Tap. If any of you know Spinal Tap, um, how much more infectious can it get? Um, you know, we were told that it was incredibly infectious from the start. And every time we had a new strain, it's even more infectious. It's even more infectious than that. Delta was two times more infectious. And now this new... Uh, Arcturus strain, which is the, the latest one to hit the news over the last week or so, is even more infectious than even Omicron that was incredibly infectious. So <laughs> thankfully, they're becoming much, much milder as they go. So that's the nature of viruses. They become milder and more infectious. But then makes one question, was the original strain that infectious that we needed to go through all the lengths that we did to prevent contracting uh, COVID? So a simple home-based protocol for Omicron. Um, this has been fairly well established um, by lots of groups uh, throughout the, the years, uh, throughout the last two years, in terms of what people can do at home. Um, and they, everyone should be having this regime anyway. Uh, D3 is probably the most important thing people can, can be taking uh, for the reduction of viral uh, susceptibility. 
uh, and especially in this country where we get virtually no sun, uh, even in the summer, you need a lot of sunlight on the skin to get enough vitamin D. So most of uh, most of us in this country are vitamin D deficient and should be taking around 2000 to 4000 international units a day. Now, that's way over the recommended daily dose, which is far too low to build up vitamin D stores. And that's been shown to reduce the risk of uh, viral disease quite considerably. Um, uh, up to about 80 percent, I believe uh, uh, they've uh, prevention of hospitalization and death up to 80 between 80 and 90 percent. So very, very impressive. Zinc is vital for the immune system, as so is vitamin C. So keeping those levels up is important. So when you do have an active um, a virus infection, that should just be upped, really high dose vitamin C. Uh, zinc could go up to 50 milligrams per day even, but uh, you don't want too much. It might cause a bit of nausea. But those things cut viral replication. So zinc is very important for that uh, purpose. Quercetin is also readily available now and, and really can be useful to block spike protein. So uh, Omicron is not going anywhere. People are going to get repeat infections. So this is just useful for people to do. Uh, antihistamines probably were more important uh, when Delta was around because you had that day seven, day eight flare of uh, the sort of hypersensitivity reaction. That still does happen if people overdo it. So uh, antihistamines have their place uh, and can, can limit that histamine response. And aspirin is probably the most sensible thing to take when you have uh, COVID because you want to prevent that microclotting. You want to prevent thrombus formation. Uh, and that is a feature of COVID. And the trouble is that most people take paracetamol for their headaches. Uh, and there seems to be, you know, still headaches with Omicron. And paracetamol is probably the not the worst thing you can take. It's good for the headache, but it doesn't really help a viral infection because it lowers body temperature. And that makes the virus persist longer. So ideally, aspirin is better. So you just don't want to take it long term either because it's potential to uh, affect the uh, the, the, the uh, gastric tissues. Um, so, but certainly useful for a week or two following on from infection as well, where there's this potential for clotting. So long COVID, just a little bit of a breakdown of where we are. Uh, this is up to date as of February this year. One in 32 people are experiencing self-reported long COVID. That's 2 million people. Um, uh, as of 2nd of January 2023, 1.2 million uh, were experiencing these symptoms for at least a year. So it is a long-term condition that's not going away anytime soon. 70% um, of, uh, of those say that it affected their day-to-day -day activities. So it's a massive burden of um, disease, if you want to call it that. The main symptoms at the moment, and this has changed throughout the last two years, fatigue, 71%. Difficulty concentrating with brain fog, 50%, 52%. Shortness, shortness of breath, almost half. Uh, and muscle aches were the other two main symptoms. So uh, mainly most common in 35 to 69-year-old females, more prominent uh, in females, and also people living in deprived areas uh, or those working in health and social care. Now you can draw your own conclusion from those sorts of statistics, whether... Um, for instance, those not working or looking to work more affected by long COVID. So maybe there's some psychological uh, aspect to it as well. But certainly it's a very real problem for, for everyone who's suffering post-viral um, long COVID. Should really be called just post-viral symptom, really. <clears throat> so there's up to 100 symptoms that have now been linked to long COVID, but these are the main ones. Fatigue, shortness of breath, chest tightness, anxiety, insomnia, depression. The, the, the brain is affected, most certainly, with the brain fog as well. Palpitations, cough, joint pains, digestive disturbances, diarrhea, headache, nerve pain, lack of appetite, vertigo. So that's just some of the main uh, long COVID symptoms that people have been reporting. Long COVID uh, can have a lasting uh, impact on all the body systems, not not usually at the same time, but some people suffer various uh, systems uh, being affected worse than others. So everything from the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, kidneys, musculoskeletal, general overall system. The brain can be affected with these sleep problems, depression, anxiety. Nervous system can be affected. Um, essentially, pretty much all body systems uh, can, ha can have an effect. 
skin disorders, um, not so common, but you know, I have come across people with rashes and things like that as well. And then also coagulation disorders, blood clots, et cetera, as part of this sequelae of COVID that does lead to uh, these coagulation issues with blood clotting. So most of uh, the recent understanding about long COVID is that actually it's the microclots that are causing most of the problem. Uh, and, and that's leading to this lack of oxygen, oxygenation of cells because they're not getting the blood flow that they need. So people are getting peripheral neuropathies, uh, tingling hands and feet, pain in the hands and feet. There was COVID toes during the first uh, few waves of COVID where literally people's toes would turn purple. So circulatory problems, basically. <clears throat> so relatively poorly understood. We know that but it's mainly characterized much as the same with COVID with ongoing vascular inflammation, thrombotic and hemolytic disorders, that's bleeding disorders or more specifically clotting disorders. Hemolytic disorders can mean you have both. Uh, you know, you have, there, um, there are uh, issues where you ha can have clotting and easy bleeding. You go for ongoing immune system dysfunction as well as part of long COVID. And that seems to be the moment driving, uh, driving this dysregulated immune response. So people are constantly fighting something or they feel like they're fighting something and they're just getting weaker and weaker. So there are similarities between chronic fatigue syndrome and ME and other post-viral syndromes um, th that also have long-lasting effect, as did the first SARS, COVID-1. That had long-lasting effect as well. Not, not as many people were affected, of course, but they, there was a kind of long, uh, long COVID then as well after people who got SARS, COVID-1. And quite often blood tests and, and investigations fail to pick up anything abnormal. So uh, there, there's, for a while, doctors were very dismissive of long COVID. And I think now they're finally recognizing that it is a, a real condition and, it's, uh, and people are suffering very terribly from it. So what are the risk factors? Well, this is a bit of a roulette wheel. That's why I've got that picture there. There are some theories about who is more likely to have long COVID than others. Um, one thing that would seem clear is that uh, there's varying uh, reports on this, but the, the idea that the more serious the COVID infection is, the more likely you are to have long COVID. That's not always the case. Um, some people who are almost asymptomatic do still come down with long COVID, and there may be other reasons for that. But basically, the people who are most susceptible to COVID, those who have got underlying health conditions, um, seem to be uh, more predisposed at getting long COVID. And that's people with diabetes or obesity, people with previous autoimmune conditions, possibly might be more prone to having this long grade, low grade inflammation persist for longer. Thyroid issues have been associated with long COVID and generally inflammation. Uh, inflammation um, is key to both COVID and long COVID. And if you already have an inflamed system, that's more likely to persist after a viral disease like COVID. Immune compromised individuals also, uh, HIV patients, people who've got uh, low uh, platelet counts or low white blood cells following on from cancer treatments, for instance, those uh, potentially could lead to uh, long COVID being more likely. Treatment is really important. Um, so there's this idea that Possibly antibiotics may be associated with uh, the development of long COVID. I did a, a, an informal study on one of the long COVID groups early on, and it seemed certainly in the first year of the pandemic, those that had long COVID, many of them were given antibiotics at the start um, when they either went for treatment or went to the ER or went to the emergency room because um, doctors didn't know how to treat COVID and they were trying to prevent COVID pneumonia. So, um, you know, antibiotics were often prescribed. Uh, and many of those uh, ended up developing long COVID, I think. Um, it's just a sort of personal opinion. I haven't seen a lot written about it, but we'll see later that the microbiome is vital, vitally important at uh, a whole host of modulatory functions. So if you wipe the floor uh, with antibiotics, because uh, antibiotics have a, a damaging effect on the microbiome, that could lead, uh, lead you to be more susceptible to suffering with post-viral fatigue. Um, Limited self-help, people not doing the right thing when they have a cold, you know, resting, 
uh, making sure you're hydrated, eating foods that aren't inflammatory. So there's a lot of things that people may have done when they had COVID that weren't appropriate. And, um, and possibly as a result, they had a, a dysregulated reaction or dysregulated immune system reaction afterwards. Um, high viral load has been linked to long COVID. Um, again, the severity of the initial acute uh, infection. Um, variant differences, not a huge amount that we know about that. It seems that people are still getting long COVID. Um, it could be morphing into something slightly different now with the vaccinations, we don't know. But certainly, um, they've seen more people in the first year that were coming down with long COVID. Maybe that was because they weren't getting any treatment or they didn't know what to do. Um, who knows? Diet and nutritional status, again, very important, not only for the microbiome, but also nutritional deficiencies are going to make you more likely to have long COVID. Age and gender, there are some differences between ages and genders with long COVID, like females seem to be more likely. Um, and for some people, sometimes it's young working adults that are more prone to it than elderly patients. And environmental factors, uh, that's what Chinese medicine looks at, whether you're in a damp house, whether you have pre-existing inflammation or heat or cold. One key thing also is that there, there seems to be a, a very common um, theme with a lot of long COVID patients uh, where they were completely fit and healthy beforehand. Now that's fit and healthy in a Western sense. We may, if you went into a Chinese medicine practitioner, they may not agree that going to the gym five days a week is particularly fit and healthy. Um, it's, it's good for the cardiovascular system, but you may in fact be stressing out your body quite a lot. So there's this key um, idea that a lot of people possibly on day seven or eight, when you had this hypersensitivity reaction and this increase in inflammation, people felt better. And, and after spending a week not exercising, um, you know, people who quite often report, I, I went to the gym three to four times a week. I was very healthy. And then I got COVID. I went back to training and then it flattened me and they would just simply, I think, went back too early and they went back to exercising whilst they were still in an inflammatory state. And I think that's key to how a lot of people have developed long COVID. It sets up this inflammatory uh, situation in the body that just persists. So I, I think that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of so-called fit and healthy people before COVID end up with long COVID is possibly because it's mismanaging the condition after the initial uh, infection. So these are the suggested mechanisms for long COVID that are currently being talked about. Uh, organ and tissue damage from infection is the first one, and that's things like fibrosis of the lungs, actually organ damage from the spike protein from the COVID infection itself. Um, which, which may lead to constant dysfunction afterwards. Ongoing vascular inflammation seems to be key. So there's an inflammatory response that just persists. This constant inflammation not only weakens the system because you're constantly fighting, uh, um, but it also causes ongoing tissue damage. If you've got inflammation all the time, uh, that's not a good situation to be in. There's this idea that viral persistence may play a role as well. Um, and that's not just related to uh, long COVID. It's also the idea that there's um, pockets or reservoirs for viral particles that may stimulate ongoing immune response long term. It's similar with Epstein-Barr virus, uh, uh, glandular fever. Those sorts of things can lead to chronic fatigue. Uh, and the same kind of principle is involved there. There are all sorts of viruses that, that hide away in nerves and, and different parts of the body that then get reactivated. I think shingles is a classic one that hides away in the nerve uh, ganglion. And also things like the herpes virus or HPV virus, they can quite often just um, go into dormancy and then be triggered uh, and re-emerge uh, re as a problem. There also seems to be a dysregulated immune response. So the immune system should be fairly balanced uh, in terms of responding to a pathogen and then returning to homeostasis. But in long COVID, there seems to be a dysregulated immune response where there's more pro-inflammation going on than anti-inflammatory uh, uh, response. So there's this seesaw that the uh, immune system performs and, and you want a, a certain amount of inflammation during an acute uh, episode, but then you want the immune system to mop that up and return to normal. It seems that quite often the immune system gets stuck with long COVID patients in an inflammatory response. You also have hemolytic disorders and hypercoagulation, which is this ongoing um, clotting disorder. 
And there's, there's been a lot of uh, talk recently about long COVID and whether there's a, you know, micro clots um, are potentially playing into that. That that's why people aren't recovering because they've got these micro clots in their small capillaries that are, uh, are, are preventing oxygenation of tissues uh, and, and still producing an inflammatory response because your body's trying to clean all this up. And if you've got a clotting disorder, you're in this constant inflammatory response trying to, uh, trying to fix it. Also, gut dysbiosis and changes to the microbiome have been suggested for long COVID. And we know that the microbiome is affected not only by COVID itself, but also by some of the treatments, for instance, antibiotics early on, or even some of the drugs that are, that are taken routinely. It may not be for COVID. It might be people who are on, you know, um, acid, uh, you know um, acid reflux drugs like lansoprazole or omeprazole or other drugs. Uh, quite often, they have an effect on the gut bacteria. And so changes to the microbiome can lead to uh, ongoing long COVID uh, or the chances of having long COVID more, more so. And finally, mitochondrial dysfunction has also been suggested that the actual cellular metabolism itself is somehow uh, affected by the virus. Uh, and, uh, and so we have less energy production from the cells themselves. The, the ATP production is affected and people generally just cannot get the energy production from their cells. Now, some of that may be due to the lack of good bacteria in the gut. Um, they produce what's called short-chain fatty acids. That is the fuel for every cell in the body. So when, when, we, when we're ill, quite often we'll feel tired for a few weeks afterwards because we lack the ability pr to produce those short-chain fatty acids. So there's a lot of discussion about what that actually means and whether it's relevant. But I've just tried to here uh, do a sort of cross-reference to how we look at it in Chinese medicine. So again, now we're stepping over into the other camp and saying, well, this is how we understand it in a Western sense. This is what a Chinese medicine practitioner might look at. And these are they're approximate translations. They're not always, they don't always fit completely, but I've done my best to try and suggest what might be at play with all these different things. So the form, if the form is affected, uh, tissue itself is affected, then we talk about yin being affected or blood, uh, which is the fluid or the substantial part of a tissue. Um, and then the function is the chi. So both of those things can be diminished in long COVID, which is why people are fatigued. Um, this ongoing vascular inflammation can be seen as toxic or blood heat. And heat is, a, is, is an appropriate translation of inflammation, but of course it includes a lot more. So this physiological heat is a good thing. Pathological heat is a bad thing. So heat in the blood, is, is a deep inflammation of the body. So uh, we, we look to try and clear that with Chinese herbs. Viral persistence is, a, is, a, is an idea that's been um, discussed for a very long time in Chinese medicine under the category of lingering pathogens. So there's a whole school of thought around lingering pathogens and how to treat lingering pathogens. We'll come on to that in a little bit. So that's a, a, a direct um, translation, if you like, on this, this idea of viral persistence. And the same goes for dysregulated immune system responses. That can also be considered a lingering pathogen of sorts because the immune system is still acting as if there's something there. Uh, whether there is viral fragments or not, um, the, the immune system is locked into this reactive phase. So there's a, a little distinction there on the levels that might be affected for those of you who are into Chinese medicine. Blood stasis is, is the key thing with this uh, hypercoagulation because we're getting clotting. Uh, in, in long COVID, and that's a definite blood stasis uh, problem in Chinese medicine. Blood stasis is said to affect many chronic conditions because once the inflammation dries up fluids, you get thickened blood. So, you know, it's very, very small degrees of thickened blood, but it does happen if we have this ongoing inflammation, we have a tendency to develop blood stasis. <clears throat> The dysbiosis in the gut uh, is, can be seen as damp in Chinese medicine uh, and spleen deficiency. So the spleen in Chinese medicine is more akin to the digestive system and the, the transfer of nutrient from our internal uh, gut through to our cells. Uh, it's not actually the, the Western spleen as we know it uh, in, in modern terms, which is more the pancreas really and digestive system. And it, it tends to uh, want to accumulate damp. So damp can be seen as bad bacteria. Uh, quite often it's linked to the digestive system. If we get an overabundance of bad bacteria, then that's an increase of damp. We feel bloated, we feel heavy. So there's a lot of that in, in uh, long COVID where people just feel heavy, foggy headed. They've got cotton wool in their brain. 
um, you know, very tired, achy limbs. That's all attributed to damp, damp accumulation in Chinese medicine. So we'd look to address that with herbs that clear damp. <clears throat> And then finally, mitochondrial dysfunction can be seen as a not only a function, a qi deficiency, um, but also a yang deficiency. Yang is the sort of met met metabolic fire, if you like, that fires the system up. So quite often people with yang deficiency can feel cold. Uh, they can feel just poor functioning. Uh, classically with things like um, hypothyroidism uh, is, is a classic yang deficiency. So this mitochondrial dysfunction, we're not creating enough energy from the cells. Uh, can be seen as qi and yang deficiency, possibly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we just go through those very qu quickly, uh, just basically uh, repeating that. And these formulas are really just um, very standard formulas that can be applied for this type of pattern. Uh, and as we've seen before, we would we would change it due to the the nature of the patient in front of us, um, and, and based on tongues and pulses and, and those sorts of signs that we look at as well so they are just examples of formulas that may be used for these type of conditions so this organ and tissue damage um, you know direct inflammation causing this damage uh, you're getting cells and tissues that are, that are dying and being replaced or possibly have um, inflammation that's ongoing in the tissues these sorts of formulas are to treat that kind of thing with yin deficiency at its heart so they're formulas to actually build up strength and healing from inside. Um, there's one uh, here that isn't part of that, which is this uh, fibrosis formula, Juefu uh, Juyu Tang, which is a strong blood moving formula. But organ and organ damage really does include fibrosis. So if we're trying to fix that, we, we need to strongly move the blood and break up any blockage or scar tissue as well. So sometimes that's a useful formula to to use that as a strong blood mover. <clears throat> So I'm not going to go through these formulas. If you're interested in them, you can look them up uh, and, and see what's in them. They're very, very traditional uh, formulas for tonifying yin and qi deficiency. This is a, a, a very key component, is trying to get the inflammation down in long COVID. Uh, so many uh, patients have got this, this inflammation. It may present on the tongue. It may present on the skin as redness. Uh, ongoing rashes uh, is a classic example of uh, blood heat. Sometimes you'll have uh, little patches of, of bleeding under the skin, uh, or just generally um, skin conditions like eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, all those things can be blood heat. So um, this, is, this is just a, a breakdown of what we're talking about, this increased cytokine activity, the irritation of tissues, mast cell activation and a greater amount of histamine being, being released in local tissues. Again, it's all part of this inflammatory response. And that seems to be ongoing to, to a certain degree or another in, in long COVID. Uh, and this is treated as smoldering level heat in Chinese medicine, consuming body fluids and hampering the function, which is qi. And we're using anti-inflammatory herbs from that list uh, we had before, or, or some of these aren't on there, but things like rhubarb root, scutellaria, huang chin, uh, prunella, uh, jacuzzao, shengdi, which is uh, Romania. This is a... Uh, 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 Romania root, which is used for cooling the blood uh, and moving the blood. Mudan pea and churchow are these peony, uh, peony plants, which are also very good for cooling the blood. And mudan pea specifically is very good for allergies and things like that. So a large dose of mudan pea can sometimes bring down histamine response quite significantly. So other antihistamine formulas might be used as well. <clears throat> Viral persistence brings us into this lingering pathogen um, formulas that we use, depending on where the pathogen is lodged. So, um, you know, if we're looking at the first two layers of the body, the Wei and Qi level, we might use uh, these formulas that are designed to vent a pathogen outwards. Um, and if, there, if there's deeper, sorry, Wu Mei Wan on the bottom there should be, shouldn't be on that first list. Um, apologies for that. Or we're looking at uh, cooling the pathogen or getting rid of the pathogen at a deeper level, at this yin and blood level, which would use some of these formulas here, which don't necessarily vent as much, but they're actually just designed to, to treat the pathogen in situ if it's got deep into the body. Wu Mei Wan is Chinese plum formula, which is very interesting because Wu Mei Wan was the basis of a formula that's been studied quite widely for peanut an anaphylaxis. And they found that using Wu Mei Wan as well as Ganoderma, which is Ling Jiu, it's a medical mushroom, combined, completely switched off peanut anaphylaxis in a mice model. 
now they're, they're doing trials to to scale that up to um, human trials of course but it was interesting that it, it could do that they tried to deconstruct the formula and it didn't work as well so it's a large uh, chinese formula that uh, used as it was designed uh, can be useful for these deep-seated um, reactive um, pathogens it's also used for worms and parasites uh, by the way um, so the dysregulated dis immune response, and we come on to that, that can also be classed in a way as lingering pathogens, as I said before, but also as spleen and lung deficiency. So the spleen and lung are our kind of, um, the lungs are our first, first defense, if you like, or the tissue of the lung, but um, they are the sort of upper level of the inside of the body, um, there's a barrier level. So when we have a dysregulated immune response, we have this, like I say, imbalance between the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory Th1, Th2 uh, immune system responses. So there's a tendency towards pro-inflammation, and that in itself can weaken the immune system and, and, and cause what's called immune exhaustion. That's where this deficiency comes in. Um, it's mediated by the microbiome, and that, of course, is all part of the spleen in Chinese medicine. The microbiome uh, forms part of the spleen function. Uh, and also the sort of cyclical infections um, are typical of this dysregulated immune response. We can't, the immune system can't actually shift something enough to finally deal with it. So um, you get this cyclical, feel better for a few weeks, it comes back. And then you feel better for a few weeks and it comes back and it keeps coming back. And the immune system is in a weakened state in that, in that regard. So it, it, it then, it means the pathogen is not being dealt with or um, forced outwards. So that weakens the body further as that continues. So these formulas, again, similar to the ones we looked at last time. Bu Chong Yi Chi Tang is a very famous formula for rescuing spleen qi deficiency and raising the, raising the, the, the yang, if you like, upwards. Uh, so for people who are just flat, sometimes it can give a bit of a lift. Uh, and some of these anti-allergy formulas may be useful in this regard as well. These are typically formulas we might use for hay fever, for instance, or sinusitis. Uh, and also for dermatitis, Zhao Feng San is a um, eliminate wind powder, and wind is scratching in the skin, not flatulence. So um, they're very, very uh, useful formulas for allergies and, and down regulating this histamine response. So then the blood stasis formulas that we might use uh, for getting the blood moving, getting rid of blood clots. Uh, any hemolytic disorder following on from COVID uh, into long COVID um, can be treated this way. There's a particular way that we, we, we um, diagnose this in Chinese medicine, which I'll come to in a minute. These are some of the formulas. This collection of formulas are all based on this, uh, the same formula, but there's variations on the, the Zhui Fuju Yu Tang, uh, which is the main formula for treating any blockage in the heart and chest. So that's very, been very, very useful because quite often people will feel constricted in the chest. They might have pain in the chest. They might have shortness of breath. And if that's due to blockage in some of the capillaries or, or blood vessels of the heart, then uh, Shui Fuju Yu Tang, this drive out stasis in the mansion of the blood formula is fantastic. It's used for cardiac conditions uh, very successfully. Uh, and the variations of those are, there's, there's a variation if there's more pain, for instance, uh, in, the, in the whole of the body, this Shen Tong Ju Yu Tang. Um, there's one to unblock the orifices uh, and invigorate the blood, and that's mainly for, for blockage in the head. Uh, when you have foggy headedness, or even you, know, you could argue that maybe it might be useful for um, post stroke or bleeds or, or bad headaches. Um, then these two ones are, are more for the lower part of the body. So that's why they're, they're not in bold. Um, and Dan Shen Yin is basically just salvia on its own as a formula, which is also used as a standalone herb which we don't often use. We mainly use formulas in Chinese medicine, but Dan Shen Yin is just Dan Shen, which is Chinese sage, salvia. Uh, and that's very useful in its own right to move blood and, and thin it slightly, uh, and also act as a, um, uh, an anti-inflammatory for, for, for treating the sort of coagulation disorders. And there are others as well. <clears throat> this, is, this is what we've seen lots of in the last three years. And this, I think, is where Chinese medicine practitioners are uniquely placed to assess this in their patients, because we check tongues every day. This, um, this is a standard form of diagnosis in Chinese medicine. We feel the pulse uh, and we check tongues. 
and more specifically checking under the tongue uh, will show us whether there's any blood stasis or blood stagnation. So if there's dark vessels under the tongue, it shows there's some level of thickened blood, some level of deoxygenated blood that's making those veins dark. And that is a, a good diagnostic uh, criteria to go by when we're looking, okay, is blood stasis part of this problem? And so many long COVID cases have got this. These, these are all long COVID cases, uh, pictures from my clinic. Some of them more severe than others. The second one particularly, you see these extra little uh, blood vessels, uh, dark blood vessels that have developed under the tongue. That's pretty severe blood stasis. But most of these are, I would say, you know, 70, 80, 90% severe for blood stasis. This usually responds very well to herbal treatment. Um, so after, after three to four weeks on a good formula, which has got blood moving herbs in it, this should lighten up. There's these dark distended veins should lighten. And it gives us an idea that the blood is then moving better. So on to gut dys dysbiosis and changes of the microbiome. There are formulas that we use to actually rescue digestive distress. And digestive formulas are given every day to our, to our patients because we see a lot of digestive disorders. Zhang Xiaoliu Junzatang is probably one of the most famous ones, uh, which is a tonic for the digestive system. It acts as a probiotic uh, or a prebiotic, should I say, because um, many of the herbs that uh, are boosting to the digestion are feeding the good bacteria in the gut. So these prebiotic formulas are very, very useful. Um, this one particularly also deals with damp. So it clears damp or pathological bacteria and fosters good bacteria in the gut uh, and adds, adds to our energy production. Um, there's a, a formula that's used also for um, gastric flu, uh, which is this patchouli formula, Huoshang Shengxitang, which is an amazing formula for COVID as well, because Huoshang uh, is a great herb, uh, anti-COVID herb, but also very good for if you've got uh, gastric flu or uh, food poisoning, it's a great, a great formula to use for that. And these other formulas also treat the, uh, the, uh, the microbiome and the gut. Wuling San is great for draining damp. It was in that first formula, Ching Fei Pei Du Tang, that we looked at um, as, as part of that to drain damp or drain uh, the pathogen away. So this is just uh, some of the important uh, actions of the, the microbiome um, uh, that, that get affected uh, with, the, with, this, um, with COVID and long COVID. So you have decreased diversity of bacteria, you have lower populations of anti-inflammatory stains, like bifidobacteria is very strongly anti-inflammatory. And quite often long COVID patients are very low in bifidobacteria. Um, you have an increase in pathological strains. You might have uh, you know, increased clostridium or, or, or candida or yeasts or funguses that might uh, be overgrowing in the gut. Uh, dysregulation of the immune system. That is a, sometimes a result of this poor uh, balance of bacteria in the gut. And also you'll have disruption to the gut barrier, which is really important because if the gut barrier is disrupted, you'll get inflammation, which becomes systemic. Uh, you'll get what's called leaky gut. So um, you'll get proteins inappropriately poking their head through the barrier uh, and uh, stimulating the immune response. And that shouldn't be happening. So leaky gut is a, is a cause of all sorts of conditions and, and diseases. And then this dysfunction, the mitochondrial dysfunction, we might use some of these spleen formulas for that. Um, I haven't put much in there. There's a Li Zhong Tang is, is a great formula for this cold kidney yang and spleen yang deficiency. Um, but it's, it's slightly uh, harder to classify this mitochondrial dysfunction in, in Chinese medicine. So sometimes patients respond really well to these strong tonic formulas, um, and other times in long COVID, they don't. Uh, conversely, they might feel worse if they've still got a viral aspect going on. <clears throat> so this is the Jade Screen project, which we were all involved with. Um, and this came up with uh, some guidelines for treatment of long COVID um, based on you know, sim similar, similar sorts of models. Um, I credit this to Andrew Flower, who did a great job in collating a lot of this information at the start uh, and giving us a, a, a way of seeing our way through treating long COVID. And here's this, this idea of the pathogen moving further into the body and becoming a retained pathogen with all these different uh, designations of toxic heat or phlegm heat or phlegm damp. And depending on what people presented with, that would uh, generally lead us to, to using herbs for that particular pattern. And then finally, this chronic yin and blood level, which is far more serious, 
that, that uh, is, is characterized by this blood stasis, if you like, and chi stasis. So slightly harder to deal with at times. This just goes to show the complexity of how everything intermingles. Uh, and, and there's all these patterns that um, can lead to the other. It's a bit confusing, so I won't dwell on that. And this is just a takeaway for the herbalists uh, among you, really. Um, the, 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 some of the formulas that are used for the particular areas of dysfunction that are part of the long COVID puzzle, if you like. Um, these formulas I've found uh, to be the most useful formulas that, that I use in clinics, San Ren Tang and Zhao Chai Hu Tang, simply because they're classic um, lingering pathogen formulas that are strongly immune regulating, especially Zhao Chai Hu Tang, and strongly anti-inflammatory. And then, you know, just depending on the, the signs and symptoms that accompany that, you may uh, pick from some of these herbs or formulas to include um, based on their functions. <clears throat> Just very quickly about this mast cell activation syndrome that's been talked a lot about uh, in long COVID. Uh, and this includes people who have been suffering from uh, POTS as well, um, and IBS, rosacea, migraines, all these things are, are thought to be uh, due to a possible mast cell activation syndrome where you have this, the cytokines uh, and, and um, histamine is just re released very, very quickly upon any exertion or upon... Um, uh, exposure to allergens, for instance. So quite often people who have got this sort of chronic allergies might have mast cell activation syndrome where their body is trigger happy to just respond in an inflammatory way. So um, this is sort of characterized by cytokines and amines released by mast cells. Uh, it's very, very common uh, throughout the world um, and children and allergies sufferers, uh, but th there is some sort of crossover between long COVID maybe with this um, mast cell activation syndrome. And my favorite formula, as, as, as most will probably realize, Zhao Chai Hu Tang, again, is very, very good for um, modulating that. Uh, it's, it's a great antihistamine formula in itself. And here are some others, uh, these allergy formulas that I talked about before that can be considered alongside that or separate to it. And that's the, uh, the combination of herbs that we use in Zhao Chai Hu Tang. Uplurum, Scutellaria, Hanelia, which uh, treats phlegm uh, and damp, uh, Huang Chin and uh, 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 Chai Hu clear heat uh, and are strongly anti-inflammatory. Dang Shen is, is, a, is a tonic, uh, which has got a, a, a large degree of inulin in it. Uh, and sometimes that's left out if we're treating an acute uh, illness, but uh, it's, it's essentially a, a, a prebiotic that uh, fosters the good bacteria in the gut. So it's a chi tonic. Ginger, very, very useful herb in all sorts of uh, ways, not only acutely, but, but in most formulas. And licorice and date and ginger are the sort of combination that, that look after the, the, uh, the underlying um, strength of the body. So they sort of nourish the body and, 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 and generate uh, spleen chi, if you like. So that's, that's needed quite often because uh, patients are weakened. So if you hit them with these hard anti-inflammatory herbs, they might get weaker. So the, a formula like this is beautifully constructed to uh, take into account all the different pathophysiologies that are going on. <clears throat> okay, so um, there was just a, a little bit about some more recent understanding about uh, possible reasons why long COVID may be as it is. And there's this idea that there might be sort of persistent spike protein in some of the monocytes uh, for over a year after COVID uh, in, in, in some cases. Uh, and there was a study done by Patterson uh, and colleagues in the States. And they, they found that there was a way of testing this long hauler index, as they called it, based on the number of non-classical monocytes that were expressing the spike protein. So the spike protein should, gen should generally be cleaned up uh, after an infection um, within a few weeks but it's persisted uh, in, in, this, in this instance. And it causes this vascular inflammation and vasodilation to, to become a, a, a common theme uh, and that persists. And the key thing about this is, this is why um, these, these monocytes tend to be mobilized by exercise, which is why people can only do a certain amount of exercise before they completely crash. Uh, so, you know, long COVID sufferers, unfortunately, they, they, it's a real struggle. And there's this idea that you should pace yourself and do paced exercise. But for some people, that's not appropriate because every time they exercise, 
they may have this inflammatory response going on, which sets them back again. So uh, there are better ways of exercising than you know um, pacing yourself in the gym or or trying to to do a little bit more walking or even running because that sometimes sets people the wrong way. <clears throat> so the formulas that we consider uh, uh, that we've already touched upon uh, essentially this is a um, a breakdown of what we're trying to do with our formulas for long COVID. We're trying to reduce mass cell, cell activity in those that are hyperactive. We're trying to reduce histamine reactions. Um, because there are similarities between allergy and long COVID. We're trying to rebalance the immune system uh, because that way we'll, we'll deal with the inflammation. Um, and also we're trying to, to increase blood flow to damage tissues and treat blood stasis if we see it on the underside of the tongue. So um, the formulas that, that we, we tend to use are, are clearing pathogens and, and draining damp and supporting spleen and moving blood. That's an incomplete list there. Um, so, but this is the general considerations that we're, what we're trying to do with Chinese medicine is, 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 is affect the system in multiple ways. And quite often we can do that with a single formula. We don't have to use more than one formula. Uh, that's the beauty of Chinese medicine. So this is just a little bit uh, uh, about how we deal with patients in clinic uh, when we're giving them advice on what they can do. Um, obviously a low histamine and anti-inflammatory diet does help. So if people are eating inflammatory foods, they're going to be, um, it's going to be hard to heal from an inflammatory condition. Um, stress is, is also hugely important. And, and there's, a, there's a frustration and stress that is absolutely natural in long COVID because people are, uh, aren't able to do what they want to do. So there's frustration. Um, but stress, unfortunately, A, it damages the microbiome, uh, but it, it, it feeds inflammation. So our fight or flight response is pro-inflammatory. We, we're, we're designed to be in a slightly inflamed uh, state if we're running away from the tiger, just in case you know, we get bit. <laughs> so um, it's a human uh, response to actually be slightly in an inflammatory state if we're fighting or flighting. Um, so the, what we tend to uh, suggest is gentle exercise is best for long COVID. Tai Chi and Qigong are fantastic. Uh, there's a little bit about Qigong at the end of this presentation, but it's been shown that gentle exercise in combination with mindfulness and breathing and stretching of the lungs and the different tissues of the body is a much better way to recover from, from COVID and possibly long COVID than hitting the gym or trying to pace yourself into doing more and more and more each day. Same goes for yoga uh, and, and Tai Chi, very similar, gentle exercise. Gentle weights are probably better than cardio just because of that activating mast uh, cells. And just a little caution about moving liver chi with acupuncture. Um, acupuncture is used and I use it, and we all have used it for our long COVID patients, but there is a point where sometimes acupuncture can make people feel tired because uh, it's calming, it's relaxing, it releases endorphins in the brain. Uh, and a strong acupuncture session may well feel long COVID patients may feel worse for a day or two after that. So we need to be very, very careful with our acupuncture. Um, just doing very gentle, or possibly even ear acupuncture. I use a lot of ear acupuncture with long COVID patients because it doesn't seem to have that similar draining effect. Um, but there's lots of different ways to practice acupuncture and, and lots of different practitioners are treating long COVID in different ways. Just a rundown of my personal clinical strategy that I've used with uh, with the herbs. Those are the formulas that I've used most often. It's not by it, not by any means all the all the formulas that I've used. I've, I've tended to mix it up, but uh, I've had many successes with uh, Zhao Chai Hu Tang and San Ren Tang. Sometimes in combination alongside one another, uh, and then adding things to move blood and treat damp if there's damp. Uh, there's a particular combination of herbs, Shi Chang Pu and Yuan Zhe, for instance, that are very good for foggy headedness and, and thinking. So, uh, you know, there are some herbs that we might add in depending on the symptoms that present. And there are some other ideas there uh, for moving stagnation. Uh, if people feel particularly frustrated or angry, uh, some of these herbs are great just to gently move the chi, as we call it. Okay, and then there are herbs there to, to tonify as well. One of the key things is we don't want to tonify too early in long COVID because sometimes that does um, make things worse. Uh, and this is a typical formula um, that, that I may use. This was kind of early on formula that, that I used um, uh, with some of my early patients. Uh, again, uh, not always the same, but it's typically the Xiao Chai Hu Tang 
with um, uh, Chen Pi is very good for uh, moving chi in general, uh, good to move the digestive system. Um, pearl barley, yi yi ren, is very good for draining damp. So there's an element of damp there. The Dan Chen moves the blood. And then this combination of Shou Pu and Yuan Jiu for clearing the mind, having better, uh, better thinking, uh, less foggy headedness. And then some of these additions, uh, whether people need it or not. Do we want to have a little bit of a break? So I just stop sharing for a sec. Are we all okay? Are we still alive? Is everyone still there? Um, I've got no idea oh my God. <laughs> whether I'm talking to two people or whether it's, it's just brilliant. Lauren and Malika left. <laughs> Has everyone gone? It's so good. It's just so, it's so rich. <laughs> Keep we've got... We've, We've kind of we've kind of gone over two hours. There's only a little bit left about spike okay. protein stuff. But I, yeah, I, I realized great. that we were kind of booked in for two hours. We're not booked yeah. in before we can go, yeah. go all night. Well, I'm happy to carry on, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so um does everyone need a little a little a rest, a little a wee stop or a tea tea or wee stop? Or what does everyone feel? Is there a is there a consensus out there? Um, may, may I ask how how long it would go for from here? Have you got more content to present, Martin? I've got a little bit more content, probably about another half hour. Depends how much conversation we have at the end. I mean, I'm I'm happy to keep on going. Really, I mean, I I don't have to be anywhere tonight, but I appreciate that that might not be the case for everybody. <laughs> Should we just plow on? I mean, I'm yeah, happy to do I reckon. That. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Laurie's asleep, I think. I don't know. <laughs> it is okay. nearing my bedtime, I'm not going to lie. I'm a 9.30 <laughs> <30 bedtime> person. <laughs> I sound old. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about the microbiome, which is incredibly, well, it's, it's, I think it's uh, fascinating um, because it's hugely important in the treatment of COVID and long COVID. Uh, only 10% 10 10 of our cells are actually our own. So most of us is something else, and, and that is our gut bacteria. So most of our genes that we contain are actually something else, not ourselves. Uh, it has a massive role in, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it has a, a huge role in metabolism, uh, creating short-chain fatty acids, getting calories from our foods, synthesizing drugs, synthesizing herbs, vitamins, et cetera. But most importantly, really, it has this immunological balancing effect. So our immune system, most of it, our immune system is based in the gut. And so if our gut is hampered, our immune system is hampered. So it stimulates immunoglobulins. It promotes anti-inflammatory cytokines. It downregulates pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and upregulates anti-inflammatory cytokines. So it, and it induces uh, regulatory T cells as well. So if we, if we damage the gut bacteria, most of that is going to be hampered. Uh, and they've shown now that, you know, for instance, a course of antibiotics wipes out a large proportion of our gut bacteria, which slowly come back over the following weeks. But some some families of bacteria never recover from a single dose of antibiotics. So think of people who are on antibiotics over and over again, how much damage they're doing to not only their microbiome, but their immune system. It's also important for bile acids and also protecting the gut mucosal or the barrier the gut barrier is only one cell thick so it's one cell separating us from our environment so inside our gut is the external environment essentially um, and it doesn't take a lot to get inside uh, and if we have irritation at the gut uh, barrier then that's going to cause systemic inflammation and, and things like autoimmunity so the, the 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 layer of bacteria that lines our gut and the mucus layer are a protective function as well. So they protect us. So it's a hugely important thing. This is just a, a bit of a visual representation of how the gut microbes um, can uh, affect homeostasis of the immune system. So this idea that you have these pro-inflammatory responses and anti-inflammatory responses, ideally they should be matched uh, or certainly responsive to uh, what's happening. Uh, and then the other key thing about the microbiome is the lungs have also got a microbiome and the microbiome of the lungs is hugely um, affected by a microbiome of the gut. There's crosstalk between the microbiomes. So we have microbiome everywhere. We have a microbiome in our mouth, in our armpits, in our groin, we, 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 in our skin it has got um, microbes on it as well. 
but the lungs and the and the digestive system are probably the biggest uh, microbiomes that we have and the most important for the immune uh, response to any virus for instance so they've shown here that uh, um, certainly in, in covid um, some of the 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 populations of bacteria more specifically bifidobacteria were underrepresented in patients um, who basically were hospitalized or people with severe covid had a different makeup of their uh, microbiome to those who fared fairly well with the virus so that probably has a lot to do about, about this sort of upregulation of inflammatory responses that the microbiome or a dysregulated microbiome might uh, result in <clears throat> this is a great paper for those of you who are interested in the microbiome it's very detailed and it goes through um you know, which, which populations were found to be deficient in those that were, had severe COVID and long COVID, uh, and also which ones were protective. So like I say, bifidobacteria, if you have a large number of bifidobacteria, generally your cluster is having an anti-inflammatory type uh, microbiome. So it's good to encourage those sorts of uh, those bacteria in your gut. So this is just a summation of what's in that uh, paper, really. So COVID infection has been shown to disrupt the gut and the lung microbiome because of the probably the ACE2 receptors being damaged and, and, uh, and, and attacked. So it decreases the beneficial probiotics in the microbiome, uh, increases this opportunistic pathogens, which are usually kept in check by the good bacteria. It damages the epithelial cell mucosal layer, so it's more vulnerable to inflammation and, and, and uh and, and penetration by pathogens. And that's what's called a leaky gut. So when that happens, you get this systemic inflammation because as I said, things pass through the gut level uh, or the gut barrier and stimulate an immune response, which is then systemic. So dysbiosis has been shown to, sh to lead to worse outcomes from COVID. So people who have been on antibiotics, for instance, will suffer worse from COVID if they get COVID. Uh, dysbiosis caused by COVID or spike protein from vaccination can persist and affect the immune system. Now that's a really important one uh, because not only are we getting spike protein affecting the, the microbiome after COVID, we're getting spike protein potentially affecting the microbiome after we've been vaccinated. So, um, you know, we're getting a double whammy there for our immune systems being adversely affected uh, despite theoretically generating antibodies against COVID. So also the microbiome plays a key role in the response to vaccination. So that was really interesting is that you get a better response, uh, a better end point or an outcome from vaccination if you've got a good microbiome. So whether that plays into COVID uh, vaccine damage and the likelihood of a severe adverse effect, whether that's related to the microbiome too, we don't know. But certainly diet is crucial during acute and post-viral phase and in recovery. And that's just a visual representation of what goes on with a uh, um, dysbiotic microbiome. You get this sort of leaky gut forming where things can make their way through and, um, and cause an immune response. You see on here, there's no mucosal layer, no protection. So you get all the pathogens interacting with all these molecules on the cell wall. Here you've got a nice mucosal layer and lots of good bacteria, which keep all these bad bugs out. <clears throat> So the suggestions we sometimes make um, might seem very, very uh, obvious to some, but not to others. Varied clean diet is vital. So when people are ill, they sometimes, we all do it, we sort of go for comfort food. Sometimes if we lose our appetite, we then start eating, I don't know, honey on toast or jam on toast, that kind of simple to eat tasty food, especially if we've got slight nausea. Um, and that actually isn't a great idea because uh, if we've had a viral uh, episode, we, we kind of want to populate our gut with good bacteria again. So if we're eating processed sugars, uh, if we're eating junk food, lots of fatty foods, we're going to develop a worse bacterial balance in the gut. Probiotics are very useful to supplement at that time. I suggest people have probiotics all the time because it, 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 it's a good way to boost your immune system, especially bifidobacteria. Also, fermented foods like kefir, kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, excellent, again, for building up the, the microbiome. Kefir is probably the most potent. Uh, kimchi and sauerkraut don't really make it through the stomach very well. So kefir is, is a great way to, uh, to give yourself natural bacteria, which benefits the gut uh, and therefore benefits the immune system. 
but there is has to be a little bit of care some people with long covid can't tolerate fermented foods because of the histamine uh, and that causes a, an inflammatory response so you have to be a little bit careful with some long covid patients prebiotic foods with lots of fibers and inulin those sorts of things can be very useful uh, as a way of feeding the good bacteria in the gut and also reducing stress eating slowly and uh and addressing any deficiencies there may be are also important uh, key considerations. So nutritional testing has its place. We don't do a lot of it in Chinese medicine, but um, certainly if someone is deficient in, for instance, omega-3s, it might be a huge issue uh, and that might be preventing them getting better. Same with magnesium or there might be other, other trace elements that are low. <clears throat> a little bit about medical mushrooms. These are I've, I've used these quite a bit with long COVID patients simply because they offer a really good way of modulating the immune response and modulating the immune system. So any condition that has a dysregulated immune response, whether it's eczema, psoriasis, arthritis, even cancers, um, medical mushrooms can 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 be a fantastic support. So there's all these medical mushrooms that are available. The most commonly used in COVID, I would say, is probably reishi. Um, Turkey tail is very antiviral, so it's it's useful in that regard. But lion's mane is excellent for regeneration of nerves. So if people have got anosmia, for instance, or loss of taste or smell, lion's mane could potentially help because it's it's a good nerve regenerator. And the same goes for foggy thinking and lack of concentration. Lion's mane is is a great herb for that. I say herb; it's a it's a it's a mushroom, but we use many of these as herbs in Chinese medicine. So reishi is your sort of classic king of the mushrooms, which is, has got this broad, uh, broad effect, uh, wonderful effect. They're all mentioned there. Um, that's the effects. So I'm not going to dwell on that because we are running late in time. But it can be very useful for um, increasing energy and stamina as well, uh, especially cordyceps, which has been linked to increased stamina for sport and that sort of stuff. <clears throat> So this is just a little bit about how they balance the pro-inflammatory cytokines. They downregulate these pro-inflammatory interleukins and tissue necrosing factor, and they upregulate the antiviral, anti-prolific, and immu immunomodulatory ones. Again, antiviral, anti-cancer, anti-everything really, but they they support a healthy uh, immune system essentially. So very very useful. Available in powders and capsules and, and tinctures and all sorts these days. And then just a little bit about um, qigong. Um, there's, there's been there's been lots of studies that uh, uh, of, of rehabilitation of COVID nineteen patients with qigong exercises, and this was routinely done in China, for instance. You see these uh, pictures of wards of of people all in gowns and masks doing qigong exercises uh, for people who are on the wards with COVID. Um, and it's been shown to strengthen the respiratory muscles, to manage the stress, reducing inflammation. They've done studies on this. It reduces inflammation, uh, if regular practice of Qigong, and also enhances the immune system in general. So, um, you know, similar in a way to, to mushrooms, but these sort of slow rhythmical exercises that stretch the fascia and, and, and focus on oxygenating the blood can be a real help to long COVID patients. Right into the, uh, the the crux of the word. We're going we're going there with the vaccines. Um, thankfully, um, everyone's able to speak about these a little bit more now, because for a while we weren't able to um, even question uh, the validity of, of of the vaccination campaign. Um, a little bit about e uh, efficacy. Uh, we were we were told that they were very very effective to start, but. Um, they, they were never tested to reduce transmission, for instance. Um, so that's uh, the admission of uh, Pfizer and Moderna who developed these vaccines. Um, the, 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 the efficacy was overstated really from the start um, because it was put in relative terms rather than absolute terms. Uh, this 95% effective is somewhat of a um, misnomer. Um, they clearly wane over months. So they may offer some protection for a few months, um, but uh, that wanes. So there's this need for boosters. There was an issue with possibly inappropriate administration at the start, and there still continues to be uh, a possible administration problem because uh, Dr. John Campbell uh, brought this to the fore um, uh, and, and stated that they basically don't aspirate the needle before injecting the, the vaccine. So there's no way of knowing whether they're in a blood vessel or not. And if you get a mRNA vaccine directly into the blood vessel, it goes straight to the heart. 
Whether this is the cause for post-vaccine myocarditis in some, we don't know. We suspect it might be. Um, but certainly there was uh, there was uh, the, the call to, to aspirate before injecting, but it was never taken up. It was uh, just uh, just something that they um, they recommended. It wasn't necessary. Um, this novel technology was tested very quickly. It's not, it hasn't been proved. Uh, a lot of people are concerned um, that the long-term studies are simply aren't there to, do, to, to find out if it's actually safe or not. Um, scientific consensus was highly politicized from the start. So you couldn't really question the vaccination campaign. And to a large extent, I can understand that in terms of a public health message um, right from the start, because rightly or wrongly, whether they believed that that was our way out of the pandemic, they, they thought anyone who uh, increased vaccine hesitancy should be censored, squashed or whatever. Um, I don't think it's very good for a scientific debate, but uh, I can understand in a way why they might want to do that if they think that everyone should uh, get this vaccination to try and stop the pandemic. But um, this rampant censorship has been ongoing for the last uh, two years. Um, lots of underreporting of possible side effects. Um, we know now that that, that uh, scans that have recently come out of Germany and work that's been done in South Africa is seeing that there are these thrombotic effects from the spike protein, specifically from the vaccinations rather than from COVID itself. So that 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 evidence is starting to emerge now that it is causing microclotting in its own right, and possibly this hemolytic and thrombotic effects that we see post COVID are also happening to some people post-vaccination. Not everyone, thankfully. I think, you know, the, the vast majority of people seem to be okay um, and, and the body clears up the spike protein fairly really quickly. But for some people, that may explain uh, the side effects that, um, that are being seen. There's an unknown duration of spike protein production as well. We're telling ourselves with this, this um, technology, this mRNA uh, uh, injections are, are telling our own cells to produce spike proteins. So we've no, there's been no study to suggest how long that uh, goes on for and how long the spike protein and how much spike protein is produced. It's, it's very random. So for some people, that may be a, a large amount. For other people, it may be a very small amount. Also, the product is massively variable. There's also been talk about adequate storage or some vials being more concentrated than others or degraded in transport. So again, it's very, very difficult to know, you know who's getting what and what might be causing issues. These are some of the things that I've seen in clinic, and I'm sure a lot of other practitioners have seen in clinic. Um, they've been logged with the mRNA, uh, not mRNA, sorry, the um, MHRA yellow card system, but um, that's not very used very well. Uh, and many people have gone uh, complaining of post-vaccine side effects to their GPs and been dismissed. So the the acknowledgement of patients has been very, very low. Um, it's starting to change, I think. Um, but these are some of the things that people have complained about after receiving some of the vaccines. Thankfully, some of these are just transitory and they might last a, might last a day or two. You'd expect some headaches and maybe a little bit of flu-like symptoms, but uh, inner ear issues were quite common um, about a year and a half ago. My father had labyrinthitis uh, after both of his vaccinations. Um, he was prone to it beforehand though. So it seems that if you have a weakness, uh, any inflammation that's generated by a vaccine may well exacerbate that weak area. Um, skin rashes, I've seen a, a, a fair few skin rashes directly after vaccination. Um, which some have been persistent. Um, neuropathies have been, there have been a few neuropathies. People have had arm pain, uh, exacerbation of carpal tunnel, that kind of thing in the arm that the vaccination has been received in. Shingles and herpes outbreaks, that was uh, very common around uh, the, 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 the winter of 2011. A lot of people who had the booster shots um, were all of a sudden coming down with, with shingles outbreaks or herpes outbreaks. Uh, and that's easily explainable because the immune system has been sidetracked to look at one target and possibly then other viruses are able to take a hold and and, and um, express themselves. Bell's palsy, uh, there's been reported as well. Uh, I just had a case today, but don't think it was vaccine related at all. Uh, digestive irritation, lots of anxiety, autoimmune flares. I've had people who have had um, rheumatoid arthritis that was under control all of a sudden flare up. Uh, you know, five to seven days after a vaccination. 
Um, and again, they've been dismissed by um, by their GPs. Um, and then there's the whole question of whether we're seeing an uptick in strokes, heart attacks, myocarditis, pericarditis. There seems to be a huge uh, increase in, in cardiac events um, that I think can only be attributed now to something that we weren't doing at the start of the pandemic. Um, uh, so whether it's a direct cause or whether there's contributory factors, we don't know. <clears throat> this is a, a year out of date um, about the number of reactions that have been reported. So it's probably much more now. One in one, 167 people impacted. Uh, one in 103 with the AstraZeneca. The AstraZeneca, of course, was withdrawn because of thrombo um, uh, embolytic type effects. Uh, one in 56 people with a Bandurna. So these, of course, include the mild reactions as well. So it's uh, it's not all serious reactions. But by MHRA's own admission, less than 10% of adverse reactions are ever reported. So most people will have an adverse reaction. They simply won't report it. Or they won't sometimes even consider that it's due to the vaccination. So quite often people come into clinic and, and, and they'll say, you know, when did this start? Oh, it started three months ago. Well, you know, did you have a vaccination close to that? Or yeah, about a week before. And, of course, it's 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 a, a temporal correlation, so we can't be 100% definitive that it was the vaccine that caused it. But when you see a fair few of those happening, you have to start asking questions. And a recent um, review of the original Pfizer and Moderna RNA uh, mRNA vaccine uh, documents actually found um, that uh, serious adverse effects and serious adverse effects meant actually someone going to hospital was one in 800. Uh, which is extraordinarily high. They knew this uh, in 2021, and yet they continued to suggest that young people who were at very little risk of any adverse effects from COVID continue to get vaccinated. So it's a little bit of a scandal. This is something that's just come up today uh, for me. Uh, there's a, a big uh, a group of doctors and, and physicians who are now um, trying to get the MHRA uh, to answer some serious questions about their procedures and their funding. The MHRA, of course, is the uh, healthcare regulatory authority, the medicines and healthcare regulatory authority that are supposed to oversee all our drugs and medicines. And uh, one could argue that they didn't do a very good job uh, uh, on the, the vaccinations. This is from the uh, ONS data that now suggests that the numbers needed to treat to prevent one severe hospitalization. So this has changed massively with Omicron. And now this, this, this is the government's own data that suggests that to prevent um, one 12 to 15 year old um, uh, having a severe hospitalization, you need to vaccinate 162,600 individuals of that age. Um, and if the uh, average side effects are one in 800, it really does change the risk benefit analysis of whether we are still doing the right thing. Or they're not being suggested now, but whether we were doing the right thing even in the last year. 40 to 49 year olds who have some risk from COVID, it has to be said, you still need to vaccinate almost a million uh, with an autumn booster to prevent one severe hospitalization. So that's quite startling when I when I saw that. So uh, the whole idea of whether we actually need the vaccines is uh, anymore is uh, is a big question. Um, these are just some of the things that have been shown. This, this the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, was there was a clear link with, albeit fairly rare. Uh, there was an immune thrombotic uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia vaccine induced thrombocytopenia, and that's why it was gen gently withdrawn and banned in some countries. Uh, and again, there's this sort of idea that there's possibly some thrombosis going on with the uh, mRNA vaccines as well. Um, so then this is also a, a quote from a, a paper directly, uh, 2022, suggesting that um, there is a, a, a method or a mechanism by which you can get vaccine-induced autoimmunity generated. Um, uh, from not only the adjuvants, but also the cross-reactivity and the, the molecular mimicry from the, the action of the vaccine itself. So that's, uh, that's uh, worrying um, at, at best. Um, I'll just quickly fly through this. This is a, a repeat vaccination uh, idea of this lipid nanoparticles, which is the carrier fats that they used in the mRNA vaccines, possibly causing this local uh, irritation, but also 
they initially were supposed to design be designed to stay in the arm but right from the early days we, uh, it was suggested that they actually uh, are distributed systemically so we're getting this inflammation systemically with some people uh, like i said most people clear it very quickly their immune, immune system seems to deal with it but it is a persistent issue for many i think um, that we're seeing more and more now that we just don't know the long-term effects of this infl inflammatory response that is being generated <clears throat> how does how does Chinese medicine view immunization? Well, this is just uh, from uh, one of our textbooks, which uh, show you this progression that I looked at earlier um, through to the deeper levels. Now, normally when we encounter a pathogen, it comes into our mucous membranes, throat and mouth, into the upper airways where it's dealt with with the lymph glands, uh, and you get a sort of mucosal immunity developing. When you inject something into the uh, muscle or even worse into the bloodstream, you bypass that initial immune response and you go straight to a deeper level. So you either go straight to this, this level here where you get a, the fever and chills and a, a little bit of immune response, which normally should be generated with an immunization, which is a good thing. Um, most immunizations are, 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 are very safe on the whole. Um, however, if, you, if you're injecting something, there's a chance that it could go into a deeper level. And if you inject straight into a deeper level, there's no direct route for that pathogen to exit. And that can possibly, in a Chinese medicine sense, cause what we call a lingering heat pathogen that just smolders uh, and, and uh, causes ongoing inflammation. So just a, a way of visualizing uh, which layers the immunizations go to. And again, this is this is uh, pure Chinese medicine on some of the ways where lingering pathogens might be either vented or um, cleared in situ down the bottom here if they're in a deeper level um, by these cold uh, heat clearing herbs. So there need to be a, an assessment of where the pathogen's lying, especially uh, after vaccination. As I said, most people get vaccinated, very few long-term effects, but sometimes when there is post-viral ongoing issues, you have to make an assessment of where the pathogen is lying uh, and treat accordingly with these traditional models. It's very, um, excuse me, it's very unsure as to how successful we are at that um, because um, post-vaccine injury is, 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 a, is a difficult one to, to assess and to treat. So um, I'm not suggesting that we have answers particularly for that. But this um, just suggesting here that we may be in for a new epidemic, especially if some of the pathology reports that are coming out of Germany uh, are to be believed, where we have this widespread vascular inflammation and hypercoagulation, and we don't know how long that's going to go on for. We've got formulas to help us with that. We've got uh, things to block spike protein. We've got uh, formulas to move blood and thin the blood and, and deal with microclots. So potentially we could help. Again, it's very hard to test uh, as well um, when, when people may have these small microclots. Another frightening thing that came out of these um, new reports was that there was a protein in the blood, which upon death coagulates to this you know, white fibrous uh, substance. Uh, and that's uh, in suspension in the blood, even in uh, patients that have been had blood draws taken from them uh, who are alive. And so we don't know what that protein is particularly. Um, it, 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 in Chinese medicine, I, I think it's probably akin to phlegm, phlegm and damp that's in suspension in the blood. And it shouldn't really be in the blood. Um, th there could be ongoing inflammation on the walls of the, the, the vessels, which are creating this sort of extra protein maybe that's floating around in the blood. And whilst it's not blocking, it's certainly making things sluggish. So there's lots of uh, lots of ideas about um, what exactly we're seeing uh, in in some of these new pathological findings. So there's just a bit of a breakdown there. Um, and some of these issues that that can be a result of vaccination uh, adverse events. Thankfully, hopefully, relatively rare, but they certainly happen, and um, they need to be acknowledged. This just very, very quickly, just to sort of finish off, really. Um, uh, we're, deviated tongues are a, um, um, a suggestion that there is some form of neurological issue going on, uh, either post um, uh, TIA or a, a post stroke or post bleed. Um, sometimes it's a, a blockage in the back of the head. I've come across deviated tongues with tumors, for instance, in the back of the head. But I've noticed a lot more patients with deviated tongues. 
and uh, one or two of them had had that confirmed that they had a minor stroke. Whether that's due to um, exposure to spike protein through repeated infections of COVID or whether it's been compounded by the fact that they've had booster shots along the way and, and are continually being exposed to a spike protein which can cause this microclotting, I don't know. Um, but it's certainly an interesting finding that I'm seeing far more deviated tongues than I ever have in 13 years of practice. And, and I, I came across a very deviated tongue with someone with a tumor very early on in my practice. So I was lucky enough to be able to um, try to spot one if I saw one and, and think, well, what's happening there? So this is just an example. And these are tongues that I've uh, photographed over the last few months. So all with some level of deviation. <clears throat> So we're, the treatments for post-vaccine injury, fairly similar to the treatments for long COVID and COVID, actually, um, because we're try, trying to address spike protein, reduce inflammation, because that uh, seems to be a, a key part of some post-vaccine injury, um, this ongoing inflammation, this ongoing spike protein damage, um, whether it's being bound in clots or not, we need to try and think about dissolving thrombotic clots um, in a safe manner. Some people who have already had strokes and cardiac events will be on blood thinners anyway, so we need to be a bit careful about doubling up on that. But here's some of the formulas that are used um, specifically for strokes and ischemic heart disease. Uh, and, and they are formulas that have an effect of dissolving phlegm, softening uh, accumulations and moving blood. So they're the kind of formulas that we might use for atherosclerosis, for instance. And I think that's probably where some of the answers lie on possibly being able to use some of those formulas to deal with vaccine injury or ongoing effects of spike protein damage. And like I say, it's uh, it's not entirely clear as to whether it's from vaccination or whether it's from repeat exposure to COVID. Um, it's the spike protein that, that is causing the issue, full stop. And then just finally, some combos, which I think may be very useful. Dan Shen is this salvia, very, very useful. Shan Jia is hawthorn. And hawthorn is a fantastic herb for uh, moving blood in the heart. It's used for cardiac issues all the time. But it's also uh, a digestive herb, specifically good at dissolving proteins or um, assimilating proteins. It's, a, it's an enzymatic herb. So some of these... Um, Protolytic enzymes have been talked about as a possible mechanism for dissolving uh, proteins in the blood, uh, as well as proteins in the digestive system. I don't know whether that will, uh, will work for spike protein itself, but whether it uh, would work for some of these other accumulations of protein that we're seeing in the, in the, possibly in blood. Um, it would seem like it might be a good combination. And they're both very good for heart circulation. And they're also both anti-inflammatory. Hu Jiang is this polygonum, which again dissolves phlegm as a sort of secondary um, category. Uh, so that's a really useful herb to continue to use. And then Shu Chang Pu and Yuan Zhe, again, we've used them for clearing the mind, but they have a phlegm dissolving and orifice opening um, function in Chinese medicine. So again, I don't know whether they're, they're useful in post-vaccine uh, treatment, but it would seem they might be. And finally, one slide on N-acetylcysteine, which has had a lot of research, which is very important for the production of glutathione, which is a very, very potent free radical scavenger. So if we can increase glutathione, uh, it, it is a massive help to, to reducing inflammation. So N-acetylcysteine uh, is useful for that. It also prevents oxygen, oxygen um, oxidative stress and damage. So it's actually protecting against the tissue uh, damage that, that is from constant uh, inflammation and irritation. So there, there are these benefits as well. Uh, thins mucus benefits lung tissue. So it's good for recovery of COVID anyway. It seems to be a very useful thing. And a lot of people are using it in long COVID and COVID recovery as well as acute COVID. So it may have a use in spike protein damage as well. And there's my final slide, um, just some of the metabolites for the treatment of atherosclerosis. These are just some of them that have been shown to be very, very useful. Quercetin is in many herbs. Resveratrol is in grapes and wine, thankfully, but it's also in a lot of herbs, and that has a, a potent anti-oxidative uh, and blood-moving uh, effect. Curcumin is from turmeric, uh, again, a useful anti-inflammatory, which moves the blood. Um, 
Solidricide, a useful component. Danshen is the salvia. Berberine is a very bitter cold um, anti-inflammatory herb that is also useful for blood sugar regulation. Uh, quercetin we've already seen and ginseng uh, is useful in recovery as well, but has been in particular use for atherosclerosis. There are other herbs, of course. And that is it. So we've, we've gone uh, we've gone a little bit over, I'm afraid, but uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, I hope it wasn't too much of a, a inundation of, of information. I know that um, there's a lot of stuff there, but uh, there's no easy answers to some of this stuff. Uh, but hopefully that sort of start stimulate a bit of a, a discussion and um, yeah, just discussion uh, and, and appreciation that there's there's plenty to deal with, even though COVID seems to be less of an issue to deal with directly. There's a, quite a bit of fallout, which uh, which is occurring as a result of the pandemic. Martin, thank you so much. It's I think I need some Shachangpu and Yuanja <laughs> to try and process yes. It's it's a really generous amount of information. Thank you. And I the the quality of the gift of having this as a recording to be able to go back and check things is is extraordinary. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Yeah, really amazing, Martin. Thank you so much. Yeah.